Lizzie Borden took an axe. She gave her mother forty wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father forty one. <laughs>《Hi there, I'm Christina Pichols, actor and wannabe sleuth, and this is Hollywood or History, where I break down Hollywood takes on true crime stories. In today's episode, I examine Lizzie Borden took an axe, the 2014 film starring Christina Ricci that follows the life of the infamous Lizzie Borden. Warning: spoilers ahead. Good day, my murderous pals. Oh. Um, I hope the sound is good. As you guys may have no no noticed yesterday, I had a disaster, so I'm using a this loan out, and、uh, it just kind of sits here. So hopefully, it all sounds good. Okay. Um.、Uh, Hello to my audience and to the YouTube reviewer. Welcome to my completely original live stream. Okay. Oh, it sounds good. Awesome. All right.、Um, so today's episode is Lizzie Borden took an axe, which is a 2014 film, actually a Lifetime film, which is interesting,、uh, starring Christina Ricci and. To be completely honest with you, this one is just a messy mess, 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 mess. <laughs> There's really no other way of putting it.、Um, as far as historically accurate goes, we'll say the film itself is a pleasant enough film.、Um, actually, the cinematography is very nice, and the acting is very exceptional. I liked the I liked most of the cast actually. However, when it comes to getting the facts right,、uh, let's just say it's a mashup of things that are and aren't true. Is essentially what it comes down to.、Um, this film also commits what I consider to be one of the gravest sins of cinematic history and puts modern music in the soundtrack, like uncomfortably modern music. I forgot about that part. It's not my favorite thing, but I'll overlook it. I guess it, it's also not relevant to truth or not. It just is something that jumped out at me <laughs> very early on. Oh gosh! Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, Lady Grey. My hatchets are multiplying. Oh, you can't see them right now. Hold on. Boom. Because I I I I do possess two of them. That's how I am. Also, my murder board. I wanted to find、uh, articles, actual articles.、Um, sadly, there were not that many actual images, but、uh, these are real. This this one is my favorite. We're gonna get to that、uh, at the end. This is an actual artist depiction from one of the papers at the time. This is another story we'll get to.、Um, I'm not sure this is actually the reward. I think this is a mock-up, but I thought it was pretty cool. All righty. Oh no, not late. <laughs> you know what?、Uh, if you got a late notification, that's interesting because Streamyard was telling me、uh, it was Showtime. Oh, maybe I didn't hide, didn't change it in Streamyard. So it actually thought I was a day late. Whoopsie. <laughs> All righty. So let's let's just dive into it, shall we? Let's see. Where where how do we do this? There we go. I think we'll keep it a little smaller. Should we do smaller or bigger? Let's do smaller. More me, more it. More me, more it. Who cares? My my fan is is blowing my hair into my face right now. Okay, so this film actually 
does take a different approach than the 1975 one in that it does try to give you more of Lizzie Borden's life before and after the trial. So the main focus is actually not the trial. It also takes the approach, although this is kind of similar, where while it's heavily implied throughout the film, you don't see the, we'll say, how the crime was committed until the very end. So we're going to dive in, shall we? Now, I do love Christina Ricci in this. I, I mean, although I have to say, you know, lucky girl, she she still looks like she's 16. And I, I actually do think she's in her 30s when she makes this film. But she still looks so young. And then they make an interesting narrative choice that just gives me uh, rebellious teenager vibes the whole way through. So <laughs> that was my... My one issue, it just kind of kept leaping out at me. And I think you'll see what I mean as we go through some of the some of the narrative choices and the scenes that they chose to, to do here. So it opens with this tiny montage, if you will, that is supposed to be the day of the murders and includes such cliche moments as Lizzie standing at the barn window eating her pears. <laughs> you know. And uh, this, they insert this weird, which I did find a few testimonies that included this stranger lurking about. Um, okay, maybe we are going to go back to, hold on, this version, because you guys can't see my hands. Okay. Um, and, and in this one, they choose, they choose the stranger. They, they made him a hot dude just like randomly lurking outside the house. <laughs> and later on, there's a, there's a scene where I, I don't know if this is her imagination or what, where she's like making out with him next to the barn. So that's definitely a, a Hollywood choice, but I thought it was interesting that we make like hot and he looks like he's dressed as a soldier. I don't know. Creeper dude. Creepy stranger is actually hot guy you might want to might want to make out with. So there you have it. Uh, I think they're going with the uh, she was suppressed. <laughs> yes, Suzanne Rando, <laughs> the Rando hot guy. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. He's just the Rando hot guy. Um. Then again, they show her coming inside. They show her grabbing this dress and that's it. It kind of cuts to, oh, there is a scream. And then it cuts to what, we, what we'll call present day, which we don't really get a sense of how many days this is before the crime. Um, but I will say this, it opens with Emma being present. So you know, allegedly she was gone for about two weeks. So, you know, but I think they're just messing with the timeline completely. So, oh, yes, Chubby. Maybe that's what they were going with. A totally new theory that Lizzie seduced a rando and got him to do it. No, I don't think that's what it was. Again, it's very, 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 very short. It's just like a flash of her and this dude up against a barn. And I'm like, the heck? Who knows? So this one opens with the, the official scene, the start of the story. So act one, we have the family coming out of church and right off the top, they do several things. They, um, they have Lizzie make a comment about some family's fancy new carriage. Um, you know, she's admiring it. And then Emma says, oh, but father would prefer we walk. So there goes that, oh, he's he's a Scrooge. He's a he's a stingy, cheap man. And then they have this weird exchange where he's talking to some fellas and one of them says, oh, your, your daughters are so lovely or something like that. And he goes, well, if they're so lovely, how come I don't have any grandkids? So right away, we're kind of setting up Father Borden to be, well, an asshole. 
and it and it just gets better and better. They like really go home with this. So now the family is walking away from church. There's this whole discussion about the uh, dinner. And and here comes the mutton stew or what have you. Uh, but again, Emma wasn't there at this time. But Emma is the one who says, I think it's making us all sick. So we're, we're getting that story in. We're just doing it in a very not accurate way. I don't know why. Then we have a scene where we're all sitting there eating dinner and Lizzie asks to be excused and he's like, no. So again, Daddy Borden being a controlling asshole. However, we know that this scene is not remotely accurate because it was repeatedly testified to by everyone that the girls would regularly not have meals at the table, especially Lizzie. They would often go out at night they would often eat meals in their own room or by themselves. It didn't seem like it was a big deal. Um, so, you know, again, they're just using this as a way to imply that he's so overbearing and controlling when in reality, mm, he didn't seem to have a problem with, uh, with her doing whatever she wanted as far as not coming down for breakfast, skipping a meal, going out for dinner, what have you. And this comes into play multiple times in this version. Like I said, they go with the rebellious teenager vibe. They do include uh, the scene where Lizzie sees her father having these like contentious exchanges with uh, tenants or what have you. So that's accurate as far as we know. I mean, of course, once again, we really only have Lizzie's word that this happened, though I think a few neighbors also said, yeah, we've, we've seen people come by the house or something, but I don't know that it was determined that anything was, you know, not cordial other than what Lizzie claims. So, but they throw that in there. They do throw in, um, they do throw in some other suspects, basically. So we've got we've got rando hot dude lurking around the house. We've got angry tenants. Um, once again, no Uncle John. I see you guys saying it. Where's Uncle John? Uncle John is once again just not present. <laughs> Hollywood is like, who? Who? Which honestly makes me go, was it Uncle John? Because... You guys really don't want to even mention this dude. Like, he just doesn't exist, <laughs> which is a very weird choice. But they do throw in another theory. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to say it until it pops up because I was impressed. I was really impressed that they got to that one. So at least they're setting that stage of alternate theories and suspects, which the 75 film really didn't do. Um, but I will say this film definitely comes off as this is really Lizzie's perspective, almost a biography, but I won't call it that because it's not. <laughs> There's too much fictional stuff in here to call it a biography, but it has more of that vibe. Um then there's another scene. Again, we're just really, really ramming home that that Daddy Borden is very controlling. She's she's in the sitting room ironing. You know, let's get in the ironing in, I guess. It's a thing she did. And she starts like humming a song and he's sitting there reading a paper and he's like, I told you not to make noise while I'm in this room. She gets kind of pissy and walks out and then bumps into the stepmom and there's a little exchange there. So they're laying that foundation that she did not necessarily have the, the best of relationships with either parent. So they're really going with that narrative. Um, I, for, I, for, I forgot I included him sitting there reading his paper. <laughs> and I can't remember that, that actor's name, but I, I, I've seen him in several things. And every time I see him, I think he just looks like Abe Lincoln. That costume gives you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that you could definitely parallel. Um, we'll get to that. So they also include um, a scene of Lizzie stealing money 
from Mrs. Borden. Now, we talked about this the last time, how I, I don't know if this is entirely based on rumor. I haven't found yet anybody who testifies to her regularly stealing things, but this is something that has been, you know, woven into the myth that she would regularly steal things from stores. Um, and, and what they do here is actually kind of interesting because I remember kind of thinking this myself and um, well, they, they, they basically took that road where if you'll remember, Lizzie tells a story to Alice Russell about, uh, I thought I put it in there, like right there, but I guess I didn't. Um, she tells a story to Alice Russell about the house being broken into. I think I have it at the end. Let me see. Oh, okay. That's where I put it. All right. Well, we'll wait till we get there. So anyway, there's a scene of uh, Lizzie stealing this money. And then she goes dress shopping, as you do, with Alice Russell. So they take the the night before evening meetup with Alice Russell. And they just transpose it, I guess. They put it into this dress shopping experience. So that's the conversation they're kind of having. They do two things. They get in the, she's not really happy with her life. She wants more. And the comments about, oh, you know, I, I think daddy has a lot of enemies. I'm afraid something's going to happen. Though they don't really go home with that as hard as they could. Like they don't include the, she thinks that they're being poisoned part. Um, my favorite line, which allegedly she did say was feeling like the house would be burned down around them, you know, things like that. They they could have gone a lot heavier in this scene and they didn't. Um, they also don't really take it word for word. Like they, they have her saying he has many enemies, which contradicts all the testimony. Um, because almost everybody said they, they didn't really have that many, like both mother and father didn't really have that many enemies. Um, in fact, her, well, actually, I think it was the states, uh, the state who, who made the case that, you know, they didn't have an enemy among them or something like that. Now, I don't know that that's true, but they really try to make it seem like, oh, he's just an awful man and everybody hates him. Um, again, that, that's Hollywood for you. They do also have her swiping a mirror. So they're really going to use this uh, thievery. It, it comes up a lot. Um, little klepto, you know. Then it gets weird. As we would expect, right? <laughs> Hollywood being Hollywood. <laughs> There's this weird scene where she's standing in her room in front of a mirror. I mean, I, I you know. I guess all women kind of probably do this at some point, but and they have her, you know, take her dress down and she's like looking at herself in the mirror. I, I don't know what the purpose of this is really, because um, all I could think is this doesn't really fit because I mean, Christina Ricci is a very petite person. She's very tiny. She actually looks like she's having some sort of body issues, you know, judging herself and whatnot. And uh, the real Lizzie Borden, as we all have seen from photographs, was a, a lot more um, healthy looking. So I don't know what this scene is supposed to be doing other than setting it up to get kind of weird because there's a knock at her door and she, she says, father, or there's a creepy noise outside. She says, father, like he's like going to creep in her room. So I'm like, oh, are we hinting at the, you know, word I probably shouldn't say, um, inappropriate relations. And then I think, yeah, I think that's where they were going because he comes in and confronts her about the, well, actually Emma comes in first and says, oh, dad's found out about the, you stealing the mirror. And then he comes in. And she does kind of use that like sweet feminine wile to, you know, 
sort of ease his anger, um, which is actually, a, they, they use that repeatedly. And it's interesting because that is, uh, that is in alignment with the female psychopath. So they're really, uh, really angling for that here. Um, and then he forbids her from going to a party because he's so angry and she can't, she can't leave the house alone. She can't walk outside alone as you, you know, as you do. Um, again, she did that regularly. She even talks about coming home late at night, having her own key and all of that. And everyone else backs that up. So this is definitely just Hollywood's version. And this is where I said it really, really starts to feel like she's just a rebellious teenager and he's the overbearing father. And I'm like, she's 32. Um, and even though, yeah, you know, at that time, there were definitely more control issues. And, you know, the man of the house, he controls everything. There's even a line. He says something like, that. oh, yeah, because they have the murdering pigeons in there as well which I don't think I screenshotted for everyone's sake. Maybe I did. Um, but, you know, as a rebellious little girl is going to do, she sneaks out in the middle of the night to go to the party, dressed basically like a harlot. <laughs> this, this, this dress is as sexy as it gets. Um, also, don't really think it's time period appropriate. So she's at the party. Uh, this, this moment, I, I only screenshotted this because the line here, uh, some other girl says, aren't you a Sunday school teacher? And she says, only on Sundays. And I'm like, oh, that line was written just for the trailer. <laughs> it's like, so Hollywood. Yes. She went Moulin Rouge. <laughs> yes. That, that's, that's what it feels. That's what it feels like. It looks like she went totally Moulin Rouge here. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, and then they do another thing that is just not even remotely accurate. We introduce Nance, Nance O'Neill, um, the actress that Lizzie Borden doesn't meet until 1904 after the trials. All of a sudden, she's already here and they're already friends. And okay, Hollywood, sure. Um, they they didn't meet for many more years, so I have no idea why they had to throw that in there. But um, I don't know, maybe to show that she's like making friends with all these people. And there is maybe the implication it comes at the end, you know, that maybe they were more than friends. So I guess maybe that was why they just throw her in way too early in the story. But you do you, Hollywood. They got to get their, they got to get their lesbian, you know, lesbian scene in there somehow. Right. <laughs> so here's where it gets interesting. Um, as I said, Lizzie apparently told Alice Russell about the house being broken into in the middle of the day and some things being stolen. And Alice Russell says, you know, I'd never heard of this before. Now this is the night before the murders. And Lizzie says, Oh, well, because, Daddy forbid us for, from ever speaking of it. Mm, okay. So my question was, even though I think Emma does say, oh yeah, the house was broken into. What was it? Like, was it? And because that's what I pondered. I was like, is Lizzie just saying this is what happened? Or did she... Did she steal it and then tried to say that someone broke in in the middle of the day? You know, that that is the that is what they're going with in this version. So uh, he calls the police and, and Marshall here, M Marshall, Marshall, hot guy, because, yeah, the Marshall has to be sexy. Especially because I did actually just uh, read the interview with Lizzie Borden from while she was still in prison and she mentions this man by name and says, he's always been the most gentlemanly and courteous. So wink, wink, you know, 
sexy Marshall here. Yeah, that's we're going to play that up. But he says, you know, uh, we don't we don't see any any signs of forced entry, basically. And so he 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 basically implies, you know, maybe somebody inside the house stole it. And the mother, the stepmother, Mrs. Borden, accuses Lizzie, and so does her father, essentially. Um, so, you know, this is actually, I, I looked it up because I wanted to see, in the movie, they have her stealing some money and a pocket watch. And that's what, you know, Mrs. Borden says, you, you stole, it, they stole my father's pocket watch. So... Um, so this is Alice Russell's testimony and you can see, uh, she's asked two things, anything about trouble with the tenants or anything of that sort. And she says, I don't know. I feel afraid sometimes this is what Lizzie told her. I feel afraid sometimes that father has got an enemy for he has so much trouble with his men that come to see him. She told me of a man that came to see him. She told me of a, of a man that came to see him and she heard him say, she didn't see him, but heard her father say, I don't care to let you my property for such business. And she said, the man answered sneerly, I shouldn't think you would care what you let your property for. Father was mad and ordered him out of the house. So this is again, the night before the murders, which is very suspicious. They've been friends for years. But all of a sudden, the night before the murders, Lizzie is like pouring all of this information out to Alice Russell. So girl is either super paranoid all of the sudden or laying some foundation work here. But then she talks, talks about, so apparently the pigeon thing did come up and this is where it comes from. Uh, she told me of seeing a man run around the house one night when she w went home. I have forgotten where she had been. She said, and you know, it was probably that party that she snuck out to, right, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the barn has been broken into twice. Oh, well, you know, well, that was somebody after pigeons. There is nothing in there for them to go after but pigeons who who and why and what why would somebody break into a barn for pigeons super weird um they have broken into the house here it is in broad daylight with emma and maggie and me there so just the three of them and uh alice russell says I i'd never heard that before and lizzie says father forbade forbade our telling it so she asked what is taken and where's my, this is where they, they get fairly accurate because she said she broke into what is called their dressing room. She said her things were ransacked and they took a watch and chain and money and car tickets and something else that I can't remember. And there was a nail left in the keyhole I don't even know how well that would work. But if you were going to fake like somebody breaking in, that that feels about right. Just stick a nail in a keyhole and walk away. She didn't know why that was left. Again, sounds like somebody who doesn't know much about staging a crime. Staging a crime. Whether they got in with it or what. I asked her if her father did anything about it and she said he gave it to the police but they didn't find out anything. And she said her father expected they would catch the thief by the tickets. Just as if anybody would use those tickets. So I'm assuming car tickets means uh, street car tickets like a, like a taxi pass or something. Oh, and here's the other one. Uh, Lizzie also told her, I feel as if I wanted to sleep with my eyes half open, with one eye open half the time, for fear they will burn the house down over us. And then, again, this is all, apparently, the conversation the night before the murders. This is a lot to be pouring out onto your best friend. 
like, girl, you, you, you have become very paranoid. She also said, I am afraid somebody will do something. I don't know, but what somebody will do something. Oh, I don't know what. Ah, probably a transcription error. I think sometimes, I am afraid sometimes that somebody will do something to him. He is so discourteous to people. And then she said, Dr. Bowen came over, Mrs. Borden went over, and father didn't like it because she was going. And she told him where she was going. And he says, well, my money shouldn't pay for that. She went over to Dr. Bowen's and Dr. Bowen told her, she told him she was afraid they were poisoned. And Dr. Bowen laughed and said, no, there wasn't any poison. And she came back and Dr. Bowen came over. So this is the whole story about them thinking they were sick the day before with the maid testifying about and, you know, the doctor comes over and whatnot. So this part did happen. Just not sure about Lizzie's interpretation here, but it, it's kind of that implication that like Dr. Bowen can't be trusted which is interesting because she's the first, he's the first person she sends for. Um, I was so ashamed the way father treated Dr. Bowen. I was so mortified. That's a, that's like a lot. A, like it's a lot, right? It's kind of suspicious. Um, hi, vegan lion. Uh, where did this conversation take place? Okay. In the real world. <laughs> in the real world uh it allegedly took place at alice russell's house the evening before the murders allegedly all of that lizzie borden came over and told her all of this daddy's got enemies there was this thing you know he was threatened by or tenants aren't happy with him i think we're being poisoned doctor he was he was rude to dr bowen um, I'm afraid they're going to burn the house down over us. Something terrible is going to happen. She is like paranoid as it gets or trying to lay the foundation in her best friend's mind that something else could happen because she even mentions this, you know, the house was broken into in broad daylight. It's kind of suspicious. It's like really suspicious. Ooh, pigeons could have been a test run. Yeah, could be. But the the interpretation is, so Daddy Borden goes in to kill the pigeons so that no one else comes to kill the pigeons, which is weird. So now we have, after being confronted about possibly stealing this money in this pocket watch, uh, he, he comes up again to her room and has this, this conversation, you know, I've covered for you. I I've paid your fines. You've tested my patience, angry father. And then once again, she uses the, the feminine wiles and they slide the ring in there. And it does get, it does get a little inappropriate here. It starts to feel like that, you know, the way they do it though, and this is what the, the 1975 film did as well, is, is imply that it's Lizzie who has inappropriate feelings for her father. In this one, they even go so far as to have her say, you don't want me to leave. You don't, you don't ever want me to become anything. And he says, oh, of course I do, or something like that. He says, you'll find someone who will, who will understand you, something like that. And, and she goes, well, what if I never want to get married? So it's like, yeah, okay, it gets, it gets a little close, you know, close for comfort here. She's kind of batting her eyelashes and, and petting her father. Um, but again, I mean, that goes with the female psychopath. So, so I guess we're, we're going with Lizzie Borden as a female psychopath. Uh, um, oh, here's the here's the pigeon cleanup. So I didn't I didn't get the actual. He's supposed to be killing pigeons. Um, I think in this one they don't show it. They they have it happening in the middle of the night. So whether it's 
the intruder killing the pigeons or supposed to be her father killing the pigeons is unclear, but they have the pigeons getting killed and her cleaning up the messy pigeon coop. But one could also, you know, speculate that it was Lizzie that did it. She snapped and killed the pigeons. <laughs> You want to say it was a practice run? Yeah, maybe. So now we kind of get to the day of the murder. Now, like I said, or murders, I should say. This film also does the same thing where it shows you the day of kind of through Lizzie's perspective that but it, it leaves enough empty spaces so you don't know who did what. So it starts with she's out in the barn. Bridget's washing windows. And this one, Bridget has a very tall ladder. <laughs> but there's Lizzie hanging in the barn like a creeper. Um, ooh, okay. This actually came from the Wikipedia page because... I told you guys there was some discrepancies about the barn issue. And it even comes from Lizzie's own testimony. There's issues. But according to Bridget, at 10.58 a.m., she left Lizzie and her father downstairs. But Lizzie told several people that at the time her father was murdered, she had been in the barn for about 20 minutes or possibly half an hour. And this is interesting because I hadn't, I hadn't seen, I hadn't gotten to these two people. Apparently we have two witnesses saying they did see Lizzie leaving the barn at 11.03 a.m. And at 10, or 11.10 a.m., Lizzie called Sullivan downstairs. So this is interesting because Bridget testifies that she hears the clock chime 11 and then she hears Lizzie call her. So I was putting it a lot closer to 11 o'clock on the dot. This is putting it closer to 11, 10 a.m. And if she's seen coming back from the barn at 11, 03 a.m., then there's no way she was calling up to Lizzie at 11 a.m. on the dot. Now, I don't know how accurate these two dudes are. But if she was coming back from the barn at 11.03, that's allegedly after both murders have occurred. But there's this discrepancy of when she was in the barn. But I find her alibi about going to the barn for 20 to possibly 30 minutes, which is the exact window of time between when Mr. Borden comes home and is found dead. So basically, Lizzie Borden is the person with the alibi that covers the exact span of time of one murder. Like, specifically so. And no one really can verify it other than these two people saying, oh, we saw her coming back at 11.03. But that begs the question, could she have gone out to the barn to either use the water pump and maybe clean some things up or hide the murder weapon? It's true that they searched the barn pretty thoroughly and didn't find anything. But she knows it better than anyone else. And also, there's that uh, story about the hatchet that was found on the neighbor's roof so they saw her outside at 1103 which would be about the time you'd have to clean up you'd have to be finishing your cleanup to come in find the body and call up to bridget at 1110 it's the weakest alibi you could possibly come up with aside from maybe the maids the maids alibi is also pretty weak I let him in. Then I went upstairs to take a nap. 
these two women have terrible alibis, terrible alibis. And uh, so I threw in a couple pictures of the actual house and the barn because they're remarkably close to each other. And this is apparently the window that she was or wasn't looking out of, depending on which testimony we want to go with. And you can see that this this literally would look at the there, there's the side door, there's a back door. I mean, this this would look directly at it. This is a very small area for anyone to sneak in without being seen if you're literally standing at the window eating pears. And that's such a weird thing for her to claim. If the idea is to be like, you know, oh, a stranger must have broken in and done it. Oh, but I was standing there watching, so I didn't see anybody. What? Huh? This is another shot, but it's a little darker. It's a little more straight on, but you can see how close it is. And you can also, I guess in this shot, you can see how close the neighbor's houses are. Like everything is right on top of each other. So we're the day of the murder. Lizzie's out at the barn. The maid is washing the windows. Then they show her coming inside and going down into the cellar. They don't say why. Now, here's where we get an inaccurate but interesting choice. They have Bridget the maid coming inside to get water for her pail in the kitchen, which is not accurate. Bridget says she went to the barn to get the water. But they put this in here, and there's a thud. And, you know, she's like, oh, what's that sound? And that's it. She just goes back about her day. So they have that moment of somebody's killing Mrs. Borden upstairs, and the maid heard a sound but didn't investigate. She just went about her business. And, and it's interesting to me because we've all pondered this. How could two women potentially be inside the house when two murders occurred and hear nothing, nothing at all, nothing out of the ordinary, not a scream, not a thud, not a, not a person walking through the house, not a door slamming, nothing, nothing. Although Lizzie does say, I think I might've heard a moan or a something from the barn or, and I don't think that would be possible even as close as it is, but it was an interesting narrative choice. Then we we skip to Daddy Borden coming home and the exchange where she says, oh, Mrs. Borden had a note. She went out. There's an awkward moment where she hugs him. And I can't decide if this is meant to be a hug goodbye or... Again, she has this weird uh, feelings for her father. And then he does kind of rebuke her in this moment, which would go with the theory that she never intended to kill him that day. She just intended to kill the mother, the stepmother. And then in this instance, he made her angry. So she snaps. That's what they're going with. I think. I don't know. Hard to tell. Um, I will say... I should have put a I should have put a full screenshot in about the dress. Let's see. There was a better one. You can see it here. They did kind of get the dress more accurate. Um, as we've discussed, there's a lot of discrepancies. But in this version, they have her wearing a wrap dress, like a house coat. Uh, I'm not so sure about the sleeves. It's a lighter blue with a navy dark navy pattern, diamond pattern on it, which is accurate, but it has this embroidery um, embellishment going on. Again, we're closer. We're closer to what she may have actually been wearing versus what she said she was wearing. Um, and interestingly enough, they do show her wearing a, a white uh sheath underneath but you can clearly tell she's not actually wearing that <laughs> not in this shot anyways um oh wait i i remember why but i have to save that for later so she has this exchange and then you just you see her coming back in the house 
Well, actually, it doesn't even show that she went anywhere. You just see her coming down the hallway and she finds his body. Oh, now in this one, she screams. She screams bloody murder. Bridget comes running in. Then she sees the body and she screams bloody murder. So now we have women screaming, Woo! which I have questioned all along. Why did nobody like scream? Um, so at, at least they, they had more of a natural reaction. Then they have Bridget running through the street, literally screaming, help, help. <laughs> you know, just getting all the attention going to Dr. Bowens. And, and unfortunately, this is where they have it wrong. He was home when she arrives in the movie. In real life, he wasn't home. So I think we're just saving time. Oh, I almost forgot. Mrs. Churchill also has vanished. She's not in this at all. She, she just doesn't exist in this version. Um, which I find really weird because she she was a she was one of the first people to come into the crime scene and that exchange with her at the door is is a really like well known and bizarre moment so they just abandoned that i don't know why it might have been it might have been cut who knows C could have been cut for time but she's not present in any of the crime scene where the police are running around and they do like the house fills up really fast Alice Russell does come in, but for the most part, I, ha I didn't notice anybody who was Mrs. Churchill. So now we're going to enter. Oh, they did get this part right. I almost forgot. Put this in. They have Bridget going up the stairs to look for Mrs. Borden, and they have her going all the way in the room and seeing the body. So point for that. You got that one right. <laughs> Enter Hot Marshall. Hey, Hot Marshall, what's up? Um, I don't know. I guess she needed a love interest. Now, I will say uh, one thing that this film does is their, their detective work, their police work is a lot more modern than... It, it clearly was in real life <laughs> because he's going to do a lot of things that they absolutely did not do in the real case. Like, I'm just like, well, if they'd have done that, we wouldn't have so many questions and we might know who killed these people. Um, and this is the, this is Marshall hot guy. I'm just going to call him that because, uh, this is the one that Lizzie Borden said was very, very gentlemanly to her. I don't think he was this young or this hot, but whatevs. So he's questioning her. And then he decides, this is what I, this is what I mean by this didn't happen. He decides to examine her closely for blood. He looks at her hands. He looks at her face and her hair and all over her dress. And he does see that one spot, that one speck that she says was stew or something in this movie. She says it, I think it was stew. Um, I think it's supposed to be the speck that we're all led to believe was menstrual blood. You're picturing a CSI montage now. Yes. They, they kind of, they, they try, they, they try to go real hard here. And I'm like, if only, if only you had actually done that, because you can't even describe what she was wearing. Um, and so even look, <laughs> even Wikipedia is like, that shit didn't happen. Um, I found this on the Wikipedia page and I, I just cackled because it's like most of the officers who interviewed Borden reported that they disliked her attitude. Some said she was too calm and poised despite her attitude and changing alibis. Nobody bothered to check her for blood stains. <laughs> which we know is true. They really didn't. They really didn't. I genuinely am not sure that any of the, the police took real notice of what she was wearing that morning because the way they all just can't describe it. I can't. Um, 
Yeah, they did search her room, but it was a cursory inspection. At the trial, they admitted to not doing a proper search because Borden was not feeling well. <laughs> and they were subsequently criticized for their lack of diligence. Ding! Um, yeah, the police kind of sucked. I know it was 1892 and we should have to lower our expectations, but Jesus. Um, I, I think this actually might be why they, the state just like abandoned the case after she was acquitted and they were like, yeah, we're not going to bother because they realized that the police work was so shoddy. How could they even, right? Like, how could you try to find another suspect when everything is just fucked? So, Hut, Hut, Marshall, you're 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 great in the movie, but you're totally not realistic. We have Emma showing up, being uh, very supportive, very mothering. This one does not imply that she thinks anything suspicious. Uh, at first, at least. There are a few moments later down the road where they just have her showing like she hears a sound and she locks her door. And I don't know if it's because she thinks it's Lizzie creeping around the house. It is Lizzie, Lizzie creeping around the house or she's like scared that an intruder or whatever. I think they're trying to imply both. Um, but initially she doesn't seem to suspect anything. Uh they actually have Lizzie Borden wearing black at the funeral. Slow clap for that. Good job. Good job. And also that might be the most period appropriate dress she wears in the whole movie. Because <laughs> I don't know who did the costuming in this one. But there's a lot of interesting choices that are way too sexy, way too stylish, way too modern, way too, I don't know what it is. But uh, this one actually looks like it could be period appropriate. They get Emma dressed right. I don't know if that's supposed to be like the, the you know, she wants to be more fashionable, more forward, and Emma's like boring, plain Jane. Maybe that's what they were going with. But um, I hate it when you have an opportunity to do like historical costumes and then you just kind of half-ass it and you throw in all these like modern takes to try to be cool. Like show the show the wardrobe of the time it's a uh, you know it's just it's it's different use it um they have the five thousand dollar reward which is a real thing they did do this um there's actually here's a the fall river mass august 5th so really the next day they release the statement and it does say the above reward will be paid to anyone who may secure the arrest and conviction of the person or persons who occasioned the death of Mr. Andrew J. Borden and wife by Emma and Lizzie Borden. Um, I kind of find this interesting that it says arrest and conviction. That's a high bar. You can't just you can't just give us a name or a suspect. No, no, no. You want the reward. We want an arrest and conviction. <laughs> so you're going to wait a long time for that $5,000 reward right there. I just pointed in the wrong direction because I'm looking up. But um, yeah, they really did. Uh, they did do that. Um Steady search into the mysterious board and murders. Police keep the closest watch on the house and our unsuspected relative. Mr. Borden's wealth public excitement is still on the increase. Four policemen on, are on guard on the house and have been patrolling the neighborhood since the affair was made public. A few very near relatives were allowed to enter. Look, look who we get a mention of here. Those who went in today were a Mr. Morse of New Bedford, a cousin of the suspected man, and another close friend who gave his name as Fish. <laughs> Nothing suspicious about that. <laughs> These men can give 
no reason why Morse should be under suspicion other than the fact that he happened to be in the neighborhood at the time. Oh, really? He was staying in the house? That's not suspicious enough? Okay. I need to know more about this so-called fish. Do you guys want to, I want to know more about fish. Uh, if you're giving a name like that, that sounds like an alias, doesn't it? Who are you, sir? Uh, my name is Fish. I'm a close friend. Wink. Okay. And your business? I brought them fish. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, that actually leaves me wondering. Um, they never did find the murder weapon, but this is the day after. They haven't searched it very well. They haven't searched the, the house and the property. Ooh, you think, ah, well played, Jay. I think fish was a red herring. Ha, ha, ha. That's hysterical. Um. <laughs> oh, my mod is doing my shout outs. I'm going to have to go back to get them all. Um. <laughs> But what if she gave the, the murder weapon to someone else to dispose of because she was trapped inside the house? Dun, dun, dun. An accomplice. Enter an accomplice. Um, yeah. It's interesting what little tidbits you can find in these little uh, news reports. So this is the night of the murder. They do have uh, the officer spying Lizzie in the cellar, rinsing out a pan or a pail and doing something else. You can't really see what she's doing, but this was reported by the police officer. Alice Russell confirmed it. Lizzie Borden was like, I don't recall. Maybe. Maybe we went into the cellar to dump out a slop pen. Um, but this is so dark. They do have several scenes that are very, very dark. So I don't know if you guys can see it or not. But that's what she's she's doing. She's, you know, rinsing something in the cellar. <laughs> as, as you do the night after murders. So <laughs> then we go to the inquest. They do something interesting with the inquest. They break it up over several days and they sort of insert different things in between. So this is day one. And um, in this version, they don't have Lizzie being medicated yet. They, they have her seemingly coherent. But they also do something that I don't think was accurate where they de he demands the dress he asks about the dress that she was wearing the day of. She says, oh, it's still at home. And he demands it. He says, we need that in evidence. And then she burns it. So we're going to make her even more suspicious. And now this version, again, they take every liberty with this. And I don't know why, because I think, I think the original version is, is even more suspicious than this. But maybe they didn't. So they have her out back, burning it in a in a barrel in the middle of the night. And Emma comes out and sees her doing it and is like, what are you doing? You can't do that. That's bad. And then they have Alice Russell seeing this from her window, which I don't know that. No. Um, the real story is they were all standing in the kitchen and Lizzie just pulls it out and says, I'm going to burn this old dress. She's ripping it up and she's like, I'm going to burn this old dress. And Emma's like, yeah, you should totally do that. Well, that's what Emma says, she says. And then she throws it in the stove. And this is the middle of the day. There's a police officer outside. She's not doing this in hiding. And then Alice Russell is like, oh, you probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so uh, they're trying to make it even more suspicious than it was, I think. But it's still suspicious. And we still don't know what that dress was. Then they have Lizzie being medicated with the morphine by the doctor. And then we have like the next day of the inquest where she's being uh, 
you know, she's he's going at her harder and she's getting confused and she's changing her story. So they have that right, but they do change the lines a lot. One thing they do, which I just couldn't stop laughing at, they definitely modernized some of the, the dialogue here to make the audience understand what the hell they were talking about. So the one big example is in, in real life, she says she went into the barn to look for a lead sinker. In this version, they, they translate that to fishing tackle. <laughs> so we're going to modernize it for American audience. <laughs> fishing tackle. I just, every time they said it, I laughed. I was like, fishing tackle. Okay. Um, so she gets really upset with this guy. You know, he's coming at her hard. Then they do. This is interesting. So after Bridget is questioned, they have this scene of Lizzie approaching her and saying like, oh, I heard, you know, you were questioned. And she's like, yeah, I just told them what I know. And I said, you could never do such a thing. And then they have Lizzie firing Bridget, the maid, and giving her three months wages. So this is like a little bit false and a little bit true because in reality, Bridget kind of just like abandoned ship but there is the claim that Lizzie's lawyer gave her money to return to Ireland after the trial. So it's like a half seas here. We got a little bit of truth and a little bit of a lie. Um, and so this came up in the last one. It was on Wikipedia. And I went looking for the claim that the maid made a deathbed confession bum, bum, bum. because the the act of giving her money allegedly and sending her back to ireland allegedly and yeah it's a little suspicious definitely is so i went digging because i was like let me see what this is based on here's what i found this is somebody pay, put this in a forum so the Bridget confession story was originally published in Raiden's book in 1961. It was reported in Lincoln in 1967 and Brown in 1991. The story has evolved. So there's that. But this is how it was reported then. The strange, ep the strange episode occurred during Bridget's serious illness in Anaconda when she was stricken with pneumonia and thought she was dying. When Bridget first emerged from Ireland, she came, or first immigrated, sorry, from Ireland, she came to this country with a girlfriend from her own hometown. They separated soon after landing. Bridget settled in New England, and her friend went on to Montana. They corresponded irregularly over the years. The friend married and became Mrs. Minnie Green. Bridget never wrote to her friend about the Borden murders, and Mrs. Green did not hear of her, of the case at the time it happened. How would you not? Oh, well, I guess back then in the day, she lived in Montana. When Bridget finally came to Montana and settled in Anaconda, she resumed her friendship with Mrs. Green, who was living in Butte, about 27 miles distance. That's actually a good distance in those days. Like, like a lot. Um, the friends visited each other, but Bridget still did not mention the Borden murders to her childhood companion. Well, you probably wouldn't. In 1942, when they were both about 75 years of age, Mrs. Green received an urgent telephone call. 42? Okay, maybe. Yeah. I'm like, hmm? um, I was expecting it to say telegram. From Bridget, who said that she was dying, wanted to see her friend, and had a secret she wanted to confide in her before she passed away. Mrs. Green had to make arrangements to get to Anaconda, and this took her a little time. When she arrived, Bridget had passed the crisis of, in her illness, and she recovered shortly after. So that's interesting. Because here's what it says. Several days after visiting Bridget, Mrs. Green entered the Butte Public Library. I, this, is, this is getting weird. Miss O'Meara noticed an elderly woman staring at the stacks of books in obvious need of assistance. So I'm wondering if we confirm this story through the, uh, you know, library attendant here. 
The woman hesitantly asked if the library had any books on real murders. And when she learned there were quite a few, she asked if they had anything been written on the Lizzie Borden case. She told the librarian how Bridget had sent for her and related what occurred during her visit to Anaconda. While the principals were alive, Miss O'Meara never revealed the story. Aha, so this must be where it came from. She did not even tell anybody that Bridget Sullivan was living in the area. Since both Bridget and Mrs. Green were dead, she consented in 1960 to tell me the details. So he's claiming he got it directly from this librarian. Mrs. Green told Miss O'Meara, we'll call it O'Meara, right? That Bridget had informed her old friend for the first time that she had been a witness in the Borden case. Bridget said that her testimony was favorable to Lizzie, who, to show her gratitude, had given her money to visit her parents in Ireland and added that the Borden lawyer had advised her to remain in Ireland and never return to the United States. Bridget said she brought, bought a farm for her parents and stocked it with horses, cows, pigs, chicken, and sheep. That was a good bit of money. That's a lot of money. Bridget said she became restless, obtained a passport under another name, and returned to this country, going to Anaconda. Mrs. Green said that Bridget told her she was fond of Lizzie and frequently took her part in family disputes. Bridget also said that she had testified only to the truth at the trial. So why the sudden need to confess this? Mrs. Green, who had known Bridget since they were children, was frankly skeptical of her friend's story. She failed to find anything in the account for Bridget's urgent demand that she rushed to her bedside because she wanted to confide something to her before she died. Mrs. Green borrowed several books on the case from the library and returned with them several days afterward. When Miss O'Meara asked if she had learned anything, the older woman shook her head, looked puzzled, and left. <laughs> as far as Miss O'Meara knows, she never came to the library again. Bridget recovered and moved to Butte. Whether the two friends, old friends, saw each other after this episode is unknown. Hmm. So that that's pretty much it. I mean, this is his take on it uh, after that. Uh, there are many reasons to be skeptical of the story Bridget told Mrs. Green. Mrs. Mrs. Green realized Bridget had said, really said nothing, which could explain why she was asked her elderly friend to hurry to her bedside. Her claim that she had interjected herself into family disputes to side with Lizzie is unbelievable. So is her insistence that she told only the truth at trial. And despite what she told Mrs. Green, her trial testimony has been shown was anything but favorable to Lizzie. Kind of agree with that. There was also serious discrepancies in her testimony concerning the vital half hour of time unaccounted for on the morning of the murders. <laughs> One can only speculate as to what Bridget might have told Mrs. Green had she still been, thought she was dying when her friend arrived. And that's the point, right? Like she thought she was going to die. She tells this friend to, to come to her. She has to tell her something. And then she's not dying anymore. So actually, um, uh, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, I was involved in this and I told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but. Oink. Okay. Okay. So it's really not a deathbed confession. It's not a confession of anything. It's very suspicious. Um, it does make you think that she wanted to say something else. But then when she realized she wasn't dying anymore, she was like, nope, better take it to my grave. <laughs> So, but there are so many suspicious things about this whole thing. Um, uh, actually, Jay, her name is Bridget. They called her Maggie, which was the old maid's name. Um, and yeah, she did. She got out of she got out of Dodge. She actually did not sleep in that house that day she went and stayed with another maid for like two or three days so she seemed kind of scared I, I always took her actions as not as somebody fleeing because she does come back and do her work but as someone who's too scared to sleep in that house because maybe she still thinks there's an axe murderer inside. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
I think she, I think the lies that she told involved changing of the times, changing of the who saw when, what, where, because we still only have Bridget telling us that she saw Lizzie between the time of the two murders. And if you remove that element, if you remove that element, it changes everything, including the options for Lizzie Borden to commit both murders, get cleaned up, all that jazz. If you remove Bridget seeing her in between, it's game over. And Bridget even kind of does say, I didn't really see her. I heard her. I heard her talking to her father, but I didn't really see. Uh, uh, oh, wait, what? Hmm? What? Hmm? What? Hmm. So then we go to, um, you know, Lizzie's in prison. She's in prison and meeting with her lawyer. And they, they talk about the, the media spin. And this is interesting because it reminds me of a certain somebody else. So they clearly took the tactic of trying to change public perception even during the trial. And they used the media to do it. You know, that, that's, that's what happened here. Um, and she does give that interview from, from prison. I was going to read it, but YouTube doesn't like that. So um, it's also, it's not too long, but it's pretty lengthy. Um, but if you want to read it, I'll tweet it later, but it's on uh, lizzieandrewborden.com. Um, she just basically professes her innocence and says, you know, people say I don't cry, that I'm not emotional, but I am. But what I found really fascinating is the writer, the author of that article, that interview, is someone who says, I know Lizzie Borden. I knew her through the church services, like her charity work through church. So the journalist they bring in is essentially already a friendly. It's actually perfect PR campaigning. I was like, whoa, okay, clever, very clever. It goes to that whole, let's remind everybody, let's remind the jury, let, let's let's keep ramming home. She's a good Christian girl who works, you know, she she volunteers for the church and she does, uh, she she teaches Sunday school and, you know, she's just a, she's just a widow woman. She couldn't possibly be capable of these horrific crimes. <laughs> Trust us, believe us, we swear. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth a, it's worth a read. Um, I thought, I thought I had it pulled up, but, uh, she, uh, she just says several things in it. Um, but it's mostly just that, like, let me repeat my innocence here. Um, and it's actually published in the New York recorder. Um, so, you know, the headline are in a new light is the headline Lizzie Borden in jail awaiting trial. How she appeared to a recent visit visitor in her cell feels badly over the talk that she shows no grief. I know that I am innocent and I have made up my mind that no matter what happens, I will try to bear it bravely and make the best of it. Damned if that doesn't sound like somebody else. Um, then she goes into how, you know, she, she, she does feel grief. She just doesn't show it publicly because that's how she was raised. They ask her how she's doing. Um, and she says, to tell the truth, I am afraid it is beginning to tell on my health. This lack of fresh air and exercise is hard for me. I've always been outdoors a great deal. And that makes it harder. I cannot sleep nights now and nothing they give me will produce sleep. If it were not for my friends, I should breakdown. But as long as they send stand by me, I can bear it. They have been, with few exceptions, true to me. With few exceptions, she says. <laughs> um, they have been true to me, and I appreciate it. If they had not, I don't know how I could have gone through with it. I certainly should have broken down. Some things have been unpleasant. And while... Blah, 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 sorry. But while everyone has been so kind to me, I ought not to think though. I ought not to think of those. 
Uh, I think I think that's a translation issue. Marshall Hilliard has been very gentlemanly and kind to me in every way possible. A hey, sexy Marshall. Boink. Um, she says the hardest thing for me is to stand here is the night when there is no light. They won't even allow me a candle to read by and to sit in the dark uh, all evening is very hard, but I don't want any favors that are against the rules. So it's kind of a pity party, but also being like, but I understand. It's very well done. There is one thing that hurts me very much. They say I don't show any grief. Certainly I don't in public. I never did reveal my feelings and I cannot change my nature now. They say I don't cry. They should see me when I am alone or sometimes with my friends. It hurts, to, it hurts me to think people say so about me. I have tried hard to be a brave and woman to be brave and womanly through it all. I know I am innocent. Um, she reads and sews and writes, letters are my greatest comfort and I am allowed to correspond with friends. She then actually kind of name drops some people. Mrs. Ward Elizabeth Stewart Phelps wrote me a very sympathetic letter. Mrs. S.S. Fesser, Fess, Fesser, that's too many letters in that name, has been a great comfort to me. She came in and she told me that Boston women were trying to get a petition signed to secure my release on bail. I have received a great many letters from the members of the WCTU and Christian Endeavor Society. So she's really like ramming home that I have friends in the church and stuff. See, I, I'm such a sweet, sweet, kind girl that they like, they all support me. They, they all support. I know. Isn't it getting creepy? It's getting creepy. Jay's like, this is some spooky parallels, y'all. <laughs> I hadn't even really spent any time thinking about the PR spin until I went to read this, this interview and some of the other articles. And I was like, wow. You know, this is really one of the first trials where, I mean, not one of the first ever, but one of the first specifically with a female being accused of some horrendous crimes where you have the media like, uh, you know, attacking her and, and, you know, doing this, you know, smear campaign, but you also have her combating it with a PR campaign. This is the beginning of celebrity right here. This is, this is Lizzie Borden being a celebrity. And I, I don't know if, you know, it was just her lawyer giving her advice on this or somebody else giving her advice on this, but she clearly um, figured out that, look, I have to combat all these lies by giving an interview and, and trying to get my side of the story out there. And there's one other thing that she goes into. Um, it is a little thing, I suppose, but it hurt me when they said I was not willing to have my room searched. Why? I had seen so many different men that first day and that had been questioned about everything till my head was confused and in such a whirl that I could not think. I was lying down and Dr. Bowen was just preparing some medicine for me when a man came into my room and began to question me. I knew he was a policeman because he had the brass buttons on his clothes. I asked the doctor, must I see all these people now? It seems as if I cannot think for a moment longer. My head pains me so. He went out. When he returned, he said, I must see them. And then the policeman came back with another man. They spoke about my mother. And that was the time I said she wasn't, she is not my mother, but my stepmother. So she did say that. I suppose if it was necessary that I must talk to them just then, I must tell as near as what I could was right. Sometimes I'm like, huh? So... Interesting. If people would only do me justice, that is all I ask. But it seems as if every word I have uttered has been distorted and such a false construction placed on it that I am bewildered. I can't understand it. There was not a trace of anger in her tones, simply a pitiful expression. She recovered herself with an effort and we said goodbye. So it's a very favorable article. Very, very favor favorable. Ugh. Um. You could take it either way. You could take it as, you know, this is an innocent woman who was the victim of a media smear campaign because the salaciousness of it got them, you know, 
sold their papers. But you could also say, well, she was very concerned with public perception. So she took the, you know, let me spin it in my favor route and got her friends and other people to help out. Help out. It's interesting. Some things never really do change, hey? So we go to the trial. Woohoo! Um, I think they actually got some of the openings and closing arguments accurate. Again, with the testimony, they, they tweak a lot of the dialogue to make it a little more modern and understandable for this audience, which I get because, you know, we, we, this is 2014. We've got, we've got Christina Ricci in the film. It's a lifetime movie. Maybe they felt like you won't be able to follow it if we use 1892 language. But they get pretty close to the facts. And here's the here's the one that I was saying. I was impressed that they got it in there. The mysterious other axe murder that happened like right before or during the trial. Um, in this case, like it seems they put it in the trial. I think it was right before. Um, so they just have this quick scene where they show a, a mysterious individual you can't see hatcheting this other woman to death in her kitchen. Dun, dun, dun! And then they actually saw a scene, which I'm not sure is accurate because according to the thing I read, um, her lawyers didn't seize on this. They, they didn't try to use this mysterious case that happened that has similarities, but in the movie, they do. They have a scene between the two lawyers and the judge in the chambers where they're arguing like, you know, this just happened and the, and the similarities are clear, you know, and, and this should this should stop the trial. That's what he was trying to do, stop the trial. And the judge is like, no, case goes forward as it is. Um, I'm not sure if that part happened. I mean, I guess if it did, it was behind closed doors, so we wouldn't really know. Um, but what I read is that her lawyers did not seem to seize on this opportunity. They didn't bring up this other case in the trial. They did not, you know, try to say, hey, there isn't potential other suspect out there because this this just happened and, and it was exactly the same or close enough. But that could also mean that the judge said, or judges, there was actually three judges, um, ruled that you can't mention it possible possible but um i liked that they actually threw it in there because you know a lot of the other stories they just do not include any other suspects any other possibilities so this one is going to throw some some doubt the direction in the audience which is cool also that was kind of a cool scene um so then we go into the trial we've got bridget the maid testifying again sticks pretty close to what I read, at least, um, they focus on the dress and the whereabouts and the stuff like that. They have Alice Russell come in with the whole, I saw her burn a dress. She told me all this crazy shit. Hot Marshall. Hey, Hot Marshall, who testifies, you know, I looked at her real closely. That didn't happen. Um, I did, I did notice the blood stain on the skirt, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't enough. He, he testifies, you know, there should have been way more blood, way more blood. However, I did tweet this out uh, the other day. I found it was on YouTube. It was like a cold case history, something or other. They did a recreation, which I had been looking for. I was like, tell me by now that some forensic people have done a recreation having the two bodies in the position they were and hatcheting them to death. And they did, you guys. And what I found really fascinating is, so a guy does it the first time and then the girl does it the second time to see if a little petite woman could do this. And the first few blows did not actually seem to produce any blood. I was like, wait, and then I was like, oh, well, maybe that's because you got to get through the skull, whatever, you know, not to get too graphic, but it's not until you really get into the last several that they, they, they're getting blood splatter, right? But what's interesting is it, 
it's not it's not what you think. It wasn't that much. They're they're covered everything but their faces. And the woman ended up with just some on her legs. She she killed the the father on the sofa. And she ends up with most of it on her legs and a little bit on her to torso. Not a whole lot of it goes up to the face or the head. And I was like, whoa. And they also, she also did it standing in front of him. And I still think maybe could have been from behind, but who knows. Um, and the guy who did the mother actually did not have that much blood on him at all. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought we were all obsessed about how much blood splatter there would be. And when you look at the crime scene photos, they're really not, it's, it, it really doesn't splatter. It's not like all over the walls that much. In fact, in the mothers, the stepmothers and Mrs. Borden, it looks like most of the blood is pooled up on the floor. So... Maybe we're all expecting way, way more blood splat spatter than there should be. And if it's really not that bad, that makes the whole how did she get clean thing a lot easier. Like, oh, well, you know, I just wiped off my face. <laughs> or just washed my face. I just splashed my face with some water in the barn and ta-da! Um... Yeah, sure, maybe there was some on the clothes, but again, we have a mysterious dress that goes missing and one that gets burned and blah, 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 and there's more to the dress. There's even more to the dress. Every every day I look, there's a whole new thing about a dress. So, oh, what was that? I was here, okay. But Marshall, sexy Marshall, is like, no, I, I looked closely. There was no blood. I stand by my conclusion. Okay, sexy Marshall, who was way better at his job than anybody else had ever been. <laughs> um, this is, I have a glare on my screen, you guys. So I'm like, ah. uh, this is, I think this is the doctor that, uh, or the, the chemist that says she came in to buy cyanide. I think they get that in here, which I'm trying to remember if they show, like this wasn't done in front of the jury. So this is one of those interesting little sidebars. They brought them in. They brought him in to testify in front of the judges. And then the judges decided it wasn't relevant. So that testimony got kicked out. Um, the jury never heard it. The jury never heard it. Which is interesting. That's something to ponder. Do you think if the jury had heard that she tried to buy poison the day before, would that have changed? Um, would that have changed anything? Do you think? Do you think? Uh, coverage of a hearing. I'm not sure what hearing we're talking about. You're going to have to, I'll start that for later. Um, yes, Lexa, unless she hit an artery, it probably wouldn't spurt more likely to be cast off from the lifting and bringing down the weapon. I agree. I agree. And hmm, depending on how you do that. Uh, yes, Jay, I did that one last week. I hope it's still there. Um, we did that one and it's a lot more accurate than, than this version. I'll say that, <laughs> but they, they actually both go naked. You'll see. Um, Dexter would have solved this. Yeah. Dexter would have solved this. Uh, Lizzie Borden hearing. I saw, I saw Rob and uh, his friend Scott do it. I didn't know he and Runkle did one. Um, yeah. And in the movie, th in this film, they have her saying it was for poisoning of rats. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Sarah. Lots of people did buy poison for rats, but cyanide was something that you couldn't buy without a prescription. So they denied it to her. Um, 
but she said she was trying to, well, what they say the woman said was she wanted it for us to treat a seal coat or something like that, which nobody had ever heard of. So interesting. Oh, you think no, huh? Lady Gray says, I doubt it would have made it met less likely it's a big step from poison to axe murder. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so let's see. Then we bring out the skulls. These, of course, um, actually, they might be more accurate than the ones in the other film because this one... Um, I believe is this is Borden with this slice on the side of the head. And I don't have the back angle, but the backs of them were both like missing. And Lizzie faints. <sighs> the faint in here is actually hilarious. She falls out of the chair. I didn't, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the screenshot. Um, then they bring in Emma, who of course is going to back up her dear sister. And in this one, she takes she kind of takes ownership. She claims that it was her idea to burn the dress. But she insisted on it because they, they didn't want it anywhere near them. They didn't want it in the house. Now, in this instance, they're saying it was the dress she wore that morning, that day. The one that the police asked for. So they don't have that accurate because in the trial, they all say, no, 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 no. It was a different dress. This is not the dress she wore that day. So again, they're making it, she's, they're actually making it out more suspicious than it was, but drama. Then there's a scene where I have tried to verify whether this happened or not and have not been able to verify it. I do not see any reference to it actually happening, but they essentially have the jury doing a walkthrough of the house. And the the forensic doctor here is is demonstrating how, you know, this is how he was murdered. Um again, this is a very modern thing, so I don't know if it did actually happen during this trial or if this is just again Hollywood being Hollywood and like I said earlier, making more, making everything more modern than it was. Cause I'm like, I don't think they did that. I haven't found any reference. I tried Googling it. Um, unless it's hidden in the trial transcripts somewhere. I, I, I don't know that it happened, but if anybody knows, let me, if you, if, if you find out about that, let me know. Um, Because I, I looked and I couldn't find any evidence that the, the jury ever did a walkthrough. I actually wonder if that would have made a difference. All these things, I'm like, could that have made a difference in the outcome? Nah. They had a drawing of the layout, but let me, like, yeah. Amanda says that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it's Hollywood, so probably didn't. <laughs> Like, this movie is more Hollywood than history. This one is losing. Uh, I, I should have a, a counter, shouldn't I? I should, I should make a clicker for point for getting it right and a point for not getting it right. Um, so far, this one is definitely in the fiction zone. We are deep, deep, deep in the fiction zone. So, Lizzie is acquitted. They stick to that, at least. Um... Oh, happy day. And now we get to look at Lizzie's life after the murders. Just a wee bit. Just a wee bit. We have her and Emma moving into the Maplecroft house. They have, they have, um, they have, they show them kind of going through the motions of the day. So they're, they, they go to go shopping, dress shopping or whatever. And the woman puts out the, sorry, we're closed sign. So this is the, She's being shunned from society, right? Even though this is after the trial, she's been acquitted. She's being shunned from society. So they also go to church. You know, people people don't sit by them. They leave. That is all apparently accurate. This is all, you know, what happened after, which you would expect, right? You were accused of 
horrendous crimes. And a lot of people still think you did it. So, yeah, seems familiar. Um, Because guilty or not, like, yeah, that's that's what happened. So, oh, I had lots of lots of those. Then we have Lizzie throwing a party. This is supposed to be New Year's Eve or something. She's now living the life that she's always dreamed of. You know, she's hosting people at her home, which she did do. Um, she even had a speakeasy in the basement. And, of course, the return of Nance O'Neill, her friend, or maybe more. Um, again, at least the, at least this part is more accurate because they did meet after the murders, but it's, it's way too close, way too close. I think, um, they don't show you how much time has lapsed. It's just kind of meant to be like, boom, boom, boom. Emma, not happy. Sourpuss. She also makes a comment to her about like, why, why do you do that out in the open or something? So I do think we're having a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, lesbian moment you know, as you do Hollywood, we got to get it all in there. So this is where the movie goes. They're, they're theorizing here. Okay. So Emma is upset about the parties and she says, you know, these people aren't your friends, Lizzie. They're only here because you're a circus attraction. <gasps> Ooh, ouch. To which Lizzie responds in this film with asking Emma, they, oh, cause she says, you think they, they think you got away with murder. To which Lizzie says, what do you think? And Emma just kind of, don't, don't start Lizzie, you know, to which Lizzie responds with allegedly whispering in her ear how she did it and how she got away with it. So now we're in the final third act. This is this is the last part of the movie. And we're going to finally show you how Lizzie Borden did it. Okay? Finally. This whole time we've just been teasing and teasing and teasing and teasing. Did she do it? Didn't she do it? How did she do it? If she did it? Oh, my God. <gasps> so finally we're like, here you go. Here's how she did it. All right? And we're going to we're gonna go down fictional lane. <sighs> She goes down into the cellar and pulls out her shiny hatchet. Goes upstairs to where her stepmommy is making the bed. Takes off her wrap dress. Wears her shift. Creeps. Oh, wait. We have that wrong. Her room is up the stairs. Well, whatever. Oh, no. This is before she takes off her dress. I just got those out of whack. Okay. Okay. So she goes upstairs. She takes off her dress. They actually, in this film, I have to say, the uh, staircase and the layout is a lot closer to the actual one. I put this in here because the other one did not really have this, like, curved staircase. Because you can see that if you were at the top of the stairs, you wouldn't see the person. And there's some discrepancies there with the, the last film and how that works. They have her standing at the top of the stairs, and you can see her from the door and that wouldn't be accurate. So that's the actual staircase. I also want to point out that it did not appear to have carpet on it. It appeared that the staircase was hardwood, at least the one going up to the, the first, the second floor. And that's important because again, if you're walking through this house, if you have shoes on, that's going to make noise. You, you can't be silent creeping up those stairs, unless you're barefoot or in stockings. That's the only way. Nobody's walking up those stairs with shoes on and not being heard. Sorry, no. So she comes in behind stepmama and hatchets her to death. And they have her straddling her, like full on straddling her. Which is possibly accurate. It would certainly give you a nice advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
she gets her 18 wax. Look at this. Oh, we got some blood splatter on the bed in this one. Um, but as you can see, they don't have her naked. They have her wearing this uh, underdress. Emma is flipping out. So what they have her do is wipe down the weapon and wipe down herself with the underdress and hide it and the the weapon and the underdress in the basement, in the cellar. She actually puts it like behind the wood pile. Okay. Now this again kind of goes with the idea that she only intended to murder the stepmother because this looks like she thought this part out, right? She had a plan. And, uh, It seemed like she thought that was going to be enough. But. And then daddy comes home early, unexpectedly. And there's this weird exchange. And like I said, he seems to kind of rebuke her. There's this comment about like, why are you so sweaty? <laughs> Which is hysterical. She's like, because it's hot out. I don't think you would you would say that you've been like I don't think you would um, unless she looked unwell that that would be a different story you look unwell that would have been something to say then he goes and lays down in the parlor bum 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 and she snaps I guess she decides you know what you don't love me enough dear daddy <laughs> you don't love me enough so she goes back to get her trusty hatchet but this time. You know, her bloody sheath dress is, is, is already down there. Like, so this time she is going to do it naked. Ta-da! Hollywood. Let's just strip off the wrap dress at the doorway <laughs> and creep in and murder dear Papa in his sleep. Ah! Um, I do want to add, by the way, that the, this whole movie, she's kicking around the house with her hair down, which is improbable in so many ways, but also especially for the murders. I, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. She would have been at least smart enough to have her hair up, if not under a cap. Um, but, you know, this is sexier or cooler, I guess. I don't know. Now she gets blood all over her in this one. And then she goes down back into the cellar and rinses the hatchet off. Now, what's interesting about this shot is I actually wonder if they're trying to imply that this is what she was doing in the middle of the night. Um, because it's so dark. I, I don't know if that was the intention. But anyways, they show her rinsing off the hatchet and hiding it back behind the woodpile. How well did the police search the wood pile? Excellent question. <laughs> because they found the hatchets, actually like the hatchets and the axes, they found them just like in a box right there by the wood pile and they took them. But did they pull out every piece of wood and like look around and underneath and I, I I mean, we already established they did a pretty shoddy job in every other way. So maybe, maybe they didn't check this. They did claim to check the barn really well, like the next day or the day after that. So, you know, there's enough time between the actual crime and when the police really, 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 really search for somebody to have moved the murder weapon. Like there just is. And Emma, of course, reacts to this information, as you might expect, and gets the fuck out of Dodge. <laughs> or in this case, Fall River. Um, they even have a they even have the scene of her like leaving. Um, and then they 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 get the creepy child song in because Lizzie hears it from the living room or something, the dining room, and she comes out and there's children's jump roping and we have this absolutely horrendous CGI job um, because it was supposed to be like 
winter and snowing or something. It's just, it's, it actually doesn't look as bad in this screenshot because it's dark. But I was actually like, oh, this is some bad CGI, you guys. Low budget for that. Um, and the end. Now, I found these articles, which are fun, 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 fun. Um, we'll do it this way. This one, Sisters Estranged over Nance O'Neill. Well, I guess I should end with, overall, I would say Lizzie Borden took an axe is way more Hollywood than history. Way, way more fiction than fact. <laughs> like, um, they just got a few things right and then took a whole lot of liberties with the rest. Like, they really did. Um, unsurprising, given that the, the more time that passes between the actual crime and the interpretation, I think you're going to see that happens almost every time. Like they just get further and further and further away from the truth and, and it becomes more myth than fact. Um, and like I said, they made a lot of changes to make it more appealing to a modern audience. I think that was a big part of it, but this is fascinating. Like I said, there was a lot in the media about this case and it really starts to feel like the first um like tabloids you guys this is like the tabloids they're they're gossiping about this woman even you know much much later after the murders so sisters estranged over nance o'neill her entertainment causes quarrel between lizzie and emma borden special dispatch to the call Fall River, Massachusetts, June 6th. The separation of Lizzie and Emma Borden of this city has aroused no little attention in this community. Owning up to the notoriously attained... Wait. Ugh, this is hard to read. Notori... Notoriety. No, oh, oh, owning up to the notoriety attained by the sisters 13 years ago. Hmm. She'll get there, you guys. It's blurry. Um, so 13 years later, 13 years later, <laughs> 13 years, the whole town is gossiping about the sisters falling out over Nance O'Neill and parties. And it it's so gossiped about that it makes the paper, okay? Um, she's, she's a literal celebrity of the time. Um, when Lizzie A. Borden was acquitted after a long and sensational trial for the murder of her father and mother, it was impossible to get a statement from Lizzie Borden regarding the quarrel with her sister. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. But the trouble originated from some disagreement during the winter after Lizzie Borden had given a dinner and, get inter and entertainment at the Borden home to Nance O'Neill and her company. I think they mean her theater company. Lizzie Borden is an intimate friend of Miss O'Neill, whose friendship she is said to have formed last summer at a summer resort near Boston. So, again... Uh, Lizzie Borden met Nance O'Neill 12 years after the murders. Not during Hollywood, just saying. On the night of the entertainment for Miss O'Neill, the company was playing at the Academy of... Nope, we're not going to make that one out. Oh, maybe it said music. Yeah, we'll go with music. Because one letter's missing. In this city and at the close and at the close of the performance, Miss Borden's carriage was waiting at the stage door and Miss O'Neill was taken to the Borden home where the entire company later gathered. Later in the season, Miss O'Neill and her company came here again and Miss Borden again entertained the actress at her home. This time alone and quietly as Miss O'Neill was ill at the time from overwork. Emma Borden had several times reproved her sister for her for frivol frivolality. frivolity. Oof. They love to use words. It is reported that Miss Lizzie Borden is to write a play for Miss Nance O'Neill, but Miss Borden declines to either affirm or deny the rumor. Ooh. 
So she was trying to get into Hollywood. Dun, dun, dun. Um, yeah. I mean, for whatever reason, Emma did not like this. She didn't like the parties. She clearly didn't like Nance O'Neill. Um, there's some speculation as to whether it was because Nance was like known as a kind of grifter. Shocking, an actress who's a grifter. You could you could have you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, or of course, there's the other rumors that it was they were more than friends. Um, it could have also just been that Emma was kind of a, a more she was older, she was more proper, she was more of a like uptight kind of woman and and probably would have preferred to like stay in the church growing group rather than suddenly being like swept up into these like Hollywood parties and all of that. But what's weird is, is that they do imply that Nance O'Neill was like this, this grifter um, when, so somebody asked me, you know, did, did I look into her or could I look into her? And I did. And that like, I at least looked at the Wikipedia page. Um, she was actually very successful like very successful um her partial filmography let me just i'll just show you that because that alone is like i'll give you an idea um i don't know i don't know where they get the idea that she was a grifter like you like trying to latch on to rich people unless she was doing that to get funding for her theater company but these are this is just a partial filmography Starts in 1913, The Count of Monte Cristo. Um, now, I think she meant, it says up here, she meant in, they met in, da, 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 was it 1904? Yeah. So they did meet sometime before her film career. Um, But these, this is, she's got a lot of films, like a lot. That doesn't mean they were all good or successful, but she was, uh, she was pretty, pretty successful in theater and film. She went to London. She, see, stage career. This is where she started in 1893. So she's, she's been doing it about as long as, you know, Lizzie got away with murder, allegedly. <laughs> um, like this is her in a magazine in 1903. Um, so I don't know that she really needed to grift that hard. Um, but you know, I suppose I could, it could be reason. It could be reason. Now, um, last article, cause this is just, when I saw this, the headline, I was just like, that's hysterical. In the wrong of, in the, in the worst possible way, but this is hysterical. <laughs> Could you imagine your death announcement being death claims life of Lizzie Borden? <laughs> I mean, death claims life. In that, in that kind of like every obituary, right? Death claims life of Lizzie Borden. Um, I don't know why they have her name in quotations as her name was actually Lizzie. She was, she was Christian that. She did change it to Lizbeth, I think. But whatever. I just, I, this is, this is the best headline I've ever seen. If, if, when I die, can somebody just make sure that it says death claims life of um, fall river woman lived alone since acquittal on murder charge. Well, not exactly. She did live with her sister for a while. Alleged to have killed father and mother 34 years ago was nationally known. Yeah. I don't think you really need to remind people of that, but okay. Fall river, Massachusetts, June. I can't read it. Death has sealed the lips of Lizzie Borden, who 34 years ago was acquitted of the murder of her father and mother after a trial, which 
attracted countrywide attention. Lisbeth A. Borden, okay, there they got her name changed, who had lived a life of, um, let's go with eternal seclusion in the city. Ooh. After her acquittal? Died last night. <laughs> Since her acquittal. Okay. Her lawyers said today that if she left any will or any written statements, they know nothing of it. She and her sister Emma inherited their father's estate, estimated at the time of his death at $350,000. That was a lot of money back then. And believed to have increased in value since then. Emma Borden is still living, but has not resided with her sister for some years. It was on a hot day in, in August 19, 1892 that Andrew J. Borden, and then, oh, com continued on page. I don't have the continuation. Bummer. But death claims life of Lizzie Borden. That's a winning headline right there. Um, it, it, it's, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, God. Ming Mercy, death is always getting the blame. It really is, you know? Damn it. Death, it's just got such a, just, it's got such a bad rap. You know, poor death. Um, yes, I know, Jay. They keep saying mother and it's, she's her stepmother. Lizzie would be rolling in her grave. My stepmother. She wasn't my mother. Stepmother. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's why she keeps haunting people. You, you just keep calling her my mother. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Um, oh, look at that. I did it. I got through it all in under two hours. Boop, boop. It feels like it was longer than that. Ooh. Gray hat Jen. I found a thing. As per the Boston Daily Globe, 7 June, 1893, 5 p.m. edition, bird's eye view of the Borden home and its vicinity, which the jury visited yesterday. Oh, we have it. Well done. So they did. Okay. All right, they get another point. Good job, guys. Um, how did you find that? <laughs> Was that buried in one of the articles that I didn't read? <laughs> well done. Um, so the jury did do a walkthrough. Cool. I wonder if that... Every time I've seen the walkthrough, I've just thought, number one, you couldn't have been a stranger doing this because you had to know your way around. There's so many doors that get closed. You wouldn't have known that he was in there sleeping. Like, And then I, I would have thought that they would have had real issue with the idea that somebody was in here and didn't hear anything. Because that's my thing. Like, how could you not? You're as shocked as you are. <laughs> Good job. Good job. It's a team effort. We're going we're gonna to solve this case as a group. So, um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to rant about YouTube. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, but they keep telling me I'm reusing content, um, which has left me wondering, uh, what I'm going to do next week because I get to reapply, um, on the 15th, which is next Friday, I believe. But now I'm like super paranoid about what I upload. Like, oh, are they going to consider that reused content? But I want to, and I think you guys want to, do one more on the Lizzie Borden case where we just go with the speculation. Speculation gone wild. I want to unravel the dress mystery some because there's a lot more to this dress thing. Everybody has a theory on the alternate suspects. And uh, like I said, you know, this fool, he's on this. He just keeps vanishing. Like nobody is talking about Uncle John. Like Hollywood's like, who? Who? And he really is like a solid suspect. As is Bridget the Maid. Um, Granted, I... 
I don't think it was Bridget, but it's worth looking at. And uh, yes, we, we had, we <laughs> yes, Lady Grey, we have been doing it the whole time, but uh you got you guys are over there like you know really going at it and i'm over here like trying to go through the details but um i, I think I, I was gonna start i was gonna maybe make a poll and let you guys vote who you think did it and then um ooh, i still think the stealing aspect plays into it Ooh, lori's lori's all up in that stealing i mean so I have been trying, this is one thing that I'm like, this is why maybe we need one more episode. I have been trying to find um, people to verify that, that claim that she would just take things. Um, because I find it very interesting that she suddenly, again, the day before, tells Alice Russell this story of, oh yeah, and the house was broken into once in broad daylight. And you know what they took? money and a watch from my stepmom so only the stepmom's belongings only the stepmom and father did report it to the police but he forbade us from talking about it well why would he do that weird so uh-oh Julia, what if we went down the Uncle John and Bridget the Maid rabbit holes towards their ancestors to see if anybody down the line knows if there's a will? Ooh. I mean, that you go right ahead. That sounds complicated. Seven priests is still mad, sus. I know, Chubby. When I heard that, I was like, okay, that is a little too perfect. That is a little too perfect. Um, Again, things I want to read into, like, I agree, Master, Master Kenny, 666, Kenny, is it, I don't know, we'll call it Kenny, the neighbors seem to have done a good job spotting who went to the house and who left, yet they never saw the uncle, yeah, again, but there's two people that say they saw Lizzie Borden coming back from the barn at 1103, but it's super weird that she's the one that's like, oh, I have this 20 minute alibi. Okay, so you covered the time of your father's murder. But uh, Mrs. Borden was already dead. It gives that vibe that she thought she was going to be able to convince everyone or that everyone would just believe that both bodies, that both, both people were murdered at the same time. And... You know, it just happened to be while I was out in the barn. As you do. As you do. And then the police, I think, threw her for a, a loop when they were like, nah, this woman was dead for an hour. And it, it does sound pretty compelling that the body was definitely dead much longer because, again, just the blood was already, like, coagulated. Coag I can't say the word. It was already like solidifying. And then you've got the, the body was apparently already kind of stiff, not like super stiff, but getting there, you know? And then they said the stomach contents, the digestion, uh, whereas the father's body was apparently like fresh, like the blood was still running. Ooh. Which of course does ask the question, how could she have done it and gotten cleaned up so quick? But there are so many possibilities. And I don't I don't know. If it was the maid, she would have had to go, she would have had to go inside, pass Lizzie, not be seen, kill the stepmother, then go back to washing her windows. Now, I will say, washing windows, she's going to the barn, getting water. She she could have been wet and nobody would have thought the, a thing of it, right? But she, does, she doesn't change her clothes and she's not covered in blood. Unless Lizzie just doesn't mention that she changed her clothes. And she, you know, lets the father in. She would have had to let him in. 
wait till Lizzie went to the barn, kill him, go upstairs, clean herself off, hide the murder weapon, and hope, hope that Lizzie didn't walk in and 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 find the body and scream and call for her before she had time to like clean up. I mean, granted, I guess this, the reverse is also true. But if Lizzie knew that Bridget had gone upstairs to lie down, and she allegedly did, she's got a lot more of a freedom there. Oh, could the heat have anything to do with time expiration? I, I've heard a lot of people discussing that, and it sounds like it's fairly accurate, though. Um, like, it could be a little less than an hour, but it it definitely it wouldn't it would have definitely been noticed if cuz just think about it if the if the father's body was right after if he'd been murdered right after and his blood was still running then the the stepmother's blood should have also kind of still been running and like i said when you look at the photos it's all pooled up around her it's like pooled which which means you know it's been running out no. His is like more, it's like dripping still. Yeah. I've read that it is important for authorities to know that Abby died first because if Andrew died first, Abby's family would inherit her his estate because even if she was only a widow for 15 minutes, she was still his widow. I believe that is true. Yes, there is something to... Uh, the stepmother had to die first. Which would again imply that somebody either only wanted the stepmother to die or knew that in order to, to, to have the estate go to them, you have to kill the stepmother, then the father. That's premeditation. Ooh. Like, but you know, me. It it could be that um, if you, if if you're saying that like the authorities claim that she died first, just so that that was the case, that wouldn't make sense though, because they would. That doesn't benefit the authorities, and they would be benefiting Lizzie and her sister by doing that by coming to that conclusion. So had it been the other way around, I think they would have just said that. Or if it looked like they died at the same time. Ooh, Deborah. Bridget's room was in the attic and the ax was found on a neighbor's roof. Yes. I, I want to see a picture. I want to I wanna see which roof, which side, where are the windows? Because I had that thought too. If there's a if there's a window that somebody could have opened and just ch chunked it. That is information that should be. See, see, so much speculation. So, so we shall do it. We, we shall do it next week. Let's play. What if for a second, what was Lizzie's plan if Papa Borden hadn't come home early though? I think I think she wanted I think she killed the stepmom and went out to the barn thinking that she'll she maybe she's cleaning herself up maybe she's getting rid of the murder weapon maybe she just thinks that if she's out in the barn and hoping the maid discovers the body because the maid is the most likely person to discover that body in that room. And she's just waiting. She's like, she's out, in my opinion, she's out in the barn waiting. Waiting to hear a scream from Bridget, right? Like, okay, maybe that's why she's standing at the window eating three pears. Um, she's waiting. I don't think she actually went upstairs. But she's waiting in the barn, hoping that, you know, Bridget finds the body. And then when Bridget screams, she's just going to come running in and be like, oh, oh, no, 
know, someone must have broken in and killed killed stepmama, killed Mrs. Borden. Now, it does beg the question if she's out in, well, here's the thing. I don't think she went out to the barn right away. I think she kicks around the house. Um, then she goes out to the barn. Well, then daddy comes home. Then she's like, ah, shit. Where's my plan ruined? Because she says she goes out to the barn after he comes home. And the only sighting is at 11.03. So she couldn't have been in the barn the whole time. That's too, that's too long. And she keeps claiming that she saw her father when he came home. And this is where the question is. Because the only person to be able to back that up is Bridget, who might be lying for reasons. And if she only heard them talking but didn't see them talking, for all we know, what she actually heard was, Lizzie, why are you covered in blood? Ah! <laughs> and Bridget shit her pants. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. Oh, maybe she was slowly poisoning dear Papa, but let stepmother had stepmother had to go. Maybe. Yes, exactly, Lexa. As long as someone other than Lizzie finds the body, she can claim it's the mysterious burglar or Brando theory. I think that was the point. Someone else needed to find the body. She's already planted all of this with Alice Russell. Because do you really think that she just randomly had this conversation with her friend the night before the murders where she says all of this stuff? The timing is too suspect. It's too suspect. Oh, yeah, Chubby, it really feels like a plan that doesn't survive contact with the enemy. She planned everything, but then the maid fell unwell and decided to rest, and the father comes back early. Yeah, I think the father coming back early really threw it off. Well, because if he's sleeping in the living room, <laughs> so if he's in the house, and let's say the maid now finds the body and he comes rushing up the stairs. Oh my gosh. Don't you think he's going to wonder how he was in the house when she was murdered and not hear a thing? I think he would have, I think he would have asked too many questions maybe. Oh, you guys are talking about Virginia. The case is over. That's why. <laughs> Just because Cuckoo wants to file things doesn't matter. Oh. Wait. Do you know how easy it is on Ancestry to get hints of things if you know a birth date and death date? Ooh. You do it, Julia. I don't have Ancestry. She's going to make us a Borden family tree. <laughs> Okay, everybody have their assignments. <laughs> oh, everybody have their assignments. I'm digging into this dress thing. Everybody wants to know about Uncle John's alibi. What else? What else do we need to go through? Um, I was gonna shout out to all my to to those who've given me donations, and uh, my mod was posting him, and I didn't catch them all. Who will cover Jack the Ripper? Um, I mean, I might can do that one, but that one's going to be tough. There's not a lot that I know of that survived as far as, because there was no trial. So that one's still just a big group. There was never any arrests. 40 wax, but 18, 19 from the back. <laughs> Very well done, Savannah, Susanna. Um, ah. 
I'm trying to scroll back. I highlighted like some of them, but I don't think I caught them all. How far back were you going? She put them in the comments, but. Well, this looks like the beginning. Is it only 13? Because I, I have 13. <laughs> so I, I have a I have a long list, but I think some of them are older, but I don't know. I don't know, you guys. I'm losing track. But first off, shout out to Jax because she <laughs> she kind of she she sent me uh the she sent me like the she sent me some cash and then she sent me like which new interface to get. She's like, here's the one I'm using. So her donation went straight into the fixing my microphone problem. She's like, here you go. Um, Suzanne M. I know, I know you're hitting me up with multiples. So thank you, Suzanne. Lindsay C. Wait, this one's multiple people. Lindsay C. Rocco L. S. Rachel E. Renee C. Amelia, Amelia, Amelia Lou G. I suck at names. Deborah M. Karen P. Lynn M. Allison B. Duke H, Duck H, I don't, I don't remember. Duke H, Tony S, Marie W, Sabine S, My V, Megan H. You guys know who you are, right? Lori H, Linda W, Anna Marie S, Lisa I, Joe K, D, Tristan R, Angela F, Marie M, Bernard P. I, I know there are more. I know there are more. I might have missed the first. I might have missed the first round. Oh. Thank you guys, though. You have no idea. It 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 means a lot, right now. It really does. Um. Me 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 me. I'm missing people. I know I'm missing people. We need to. We need to. We need to get it together. We gotta plan this. We gotta save it till the end. So I don't miss it. Oh <laughs> uh, one of these days, it'll be like we know what we're doing. <laughs> now I'm just catching all your guys' theories. <laughs> that was a weird comment. <laughs> What did they do? Well, Blue. What did they do in the 1800s to a rebellious daughtery? Nunnery or the psych ward? I don't know. Maybe the psych ward. <laughs> they diagnosed her with hysteria, <laughs> which is different from histrionic, but whatevs. Okay, maybe I did get them all. Well, if I didn't, there will always be round three. <laughs> round 42. <laughs> ah, did I get them? Yes, I watched Runkle and Scott. Yeah, I already did that one. We're all yellowing on Twitter with the herdits. Wait, what? Oh. <laughs> Yay. Will she be naked here too? She was. If you mean Lizzie Borden, I'm not getting naked. YouTube already doesn't like me. Although would that make, would, would that actually get me approved? I hear rumors. I hear rumors that there are some YouTubers who are doing all kinds of hor horrendous things that are a violation of their ser services and yet they still have monetization. Oh, oh secret... Secret Mix Squirrel. That's a fabulous name. I am getting so sleepy finding this so relaxing. Well, I'm happy to help. <laughs> I wish I wish I could find something that made me that sleepy. Hmm. Everybody stay put right there. This is my own very personal live stream. 
<laughs> this is your live stream. You asked for two Lizzie's. We're watching number two. Therefore, mine. Hilarious. Suzanne, you're hilarious. Creep, creep. Yeah. I know, I know when that was. <laughs> I always thought she dropped it in the toilet hole. That's what was in the first movie. And I agree. That would be a great place to dunk an axe or a hatchet. Who's going to look for that? Who's going to look for that? Ah, uh, set dressing. Which scene was that? Because, yeah, they, they had much better set dressing than they did, like, costuming. The basement. Okay. Yeah. What's the motive for murdering stepmom? Apparently, they did not get along. That's been fairly well confirmed. She was, she was yakking it up to other people, saying she thought she was mean, two-faced. And then... If we're going to go with they accused Lizzie of the stepmom accused Lizzie of stealing things, that, that would do it. Yeah, hit the like button and stuff because YouTube doesn't like me. And she used whatever she wore to wipe herself down. I agree, Lady Grey. There is something to that theory, especially if it's the mysterious dress that gets burned. Or. Don't forget about the pail of water and bloody rags. Yummy. Yummy. Yeah. Every, like it, it seems like neither of the girls got along with her very well. I mean, the alternative is what? That's the problem. It's like when you look for an alternative suspect... Unless you want to go with the crazy dude who chopped up the person he worked for. But I feel like that's more likely to be a, a copycat. And he was he was arrested and convicted. So if he'd have done it, you'd think you'd think at that point he would have just been like, I killed those people, too. For the notoriety, because he wasn't getting out of prison. He might have been executed. I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a lot of rumors about that. Ooh, Jay, that's a that's an intense one. It's supposed by some that there was an inappropriate relationship between Lizzie and her dad. She killed stepmom and said, look what I did for you. And her dad rebuked her. That's kind of where this movie went, but they didn't have him. They didn't have her like saying to him. That is a pretty good theory, though. It's creepy. It's weird. But it's possible. Um, I mean, anything is possible. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, it is kind of the step. This the the Cinderella. Dad remarried the evil stepmom. Bum bum bum. Oh, you made it to alive. Hi, Julia. Yep, you made it in the end, but it's fine. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna probably do some different times at some point, maybe. We'll see. I might have to have a job. And then I'll be doing them whenever. Death, the Grim Reaper, or just death. It's apparently just death. Just death that got her. Just death. <laughs> just death that gets her. I love it. All right. I'm, I'm almost caught back up. This is what happens when I'm like, trying to actually go through something and you guys are like chatty. E Ooh. Lexa, the maid said she heard Lizzie talking to Mr. Borden, but did she say she specifically heard Mr. Borden's voice? Cause she could have heard Lizzie talking and pretending that her father was still alive. I mean, that would be crazy cool. This goes into why I think the claim that she adjusted her testimony to favor Lizzie. Here's what I think she means by that. Not that she necessarily witnessed anything herself, but she repeats what Lizzie told her about certain things. And this is one of them. Because what she says she overheard is just the part about Lizzie asked if there was mail for her. 
which is what Lizzie says. You know, I asked if, if there was mail for me or something, which you could say, okay, that, that makes it true. But then Bridget does another. Um, I, I don't really recall anything else. Uh, I was, I was back, I was, she, like she was back doing her work. So she wasn't paying attention. Convenient. And now she says she's in the other room washing windows. So, you know, there's a conversation. She's not paying attention. But she remembers the mail thing, which is basically what Lizzie says. That was the conversation. I asked if there was any mail for me. He said, none for you, something like that. And and then she was like, Are, do you think you'll take a, take a nap or something before dinner or supper or whatever? And, she, and he's like, oh, yeah, maybe. And well, blah. And then Lizzie says she leaves. Goes back into the kitchen, then goes out to the bar and something like that. And the maid is like, I was washing my windows. And then Lizzie says to me this thing about there's a dress sale or something. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to go, but not today. I don't feel well. And Lizzie says, well, why don't you go lay down then? So she got rid of her to some degree. She's like, go lay down. Unless all of that is made up and none of that exchange ever happened. And that's just the part that we're going to make up to say, okay, this is what we said to each other. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's just some things about their testimony. That's it's similar, but it's like too similar. And then, and then it becomes the maid can't remember like, and then Lizzie can't remember or Lizzie changes the story. And da, 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 da. so it's, it does give that vibe of like one person is lying and this other person is trying to back up that person's lies. But because the story keeps changing, it gets hard to keep up with the lies. Sound familiar? Ooh, I think the father had to go because he saw something about the stepmom's murder. That's the only way that makes sense. Well, but... Um, if he had seen it, then why would he be lying down on the sofa? Unless. Well, again, though, if she'd been covered in blood. Would he have just lied down and taken a nap? Unless she said, oh, I was. I was out killing pigeons in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> or Lizzie, how did you get all that blood all over your skirt? Papa, you can't ask a woman that. She did go around telling, you know, the doctor that she was on. Uh, Wild is like hashtag Uncle John. <laughs> what if any other suspects than the client than my clients are there? Do I have newspapers? Specifically like these or like, <laughs> is that a thing? You've capitalized it. I feel like that's a thing. I don't, I only know about old newspapers, but no. Oh, Julia's gone. She's down the rabbit hole looking for Will and estate documents of Uncle John and his descendants. You got it? Oh, you're looking, oh, you got it. Oh, that's your homework assignment. Okay. Better than axing people, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Better to be a shoplifter. It is a good excuse to watch from hell, Lori. I already, I already thought of that one. I was like, yeah, we could do that. It's a good movie. I'm willing to watch that and just talk about it. This is one picture of Johnny on the screen the whole time. Um, <laughs> but actually... Uh, I think what I'm going to do next is, is, is something else. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll rotate. We'll do a really old case and a new case because I just finished watching the series on Hulu called candy. And that's another story of a woman who uses an ax to murder someone and literally 41 wax. I'm like, Shut the fuck up. I can't resist that, that correlation. I also already have my props on the wall. Um, I think it's a good one. I don't actually know the real case, though. I just watched the show. But it seems pretty cut and dry. And again, they always do. Ooh. 
I was trying not to spam, so you did. So did I get them all? Did I get them all? That was that was the question. Mystery continues. Oh, thank you, Dana. <laughs> I'm going to start tweeting it more often because I have a lot of Twitter followers. I still wonder about the stepmother that was mentioned on Rob's stream, Wonderland. Oh, I read up on that, actually. Um, now I'm trying to remember where. <laughs> um, someone dived into that, and it wasn't a stepbrother. It was an illegitimate son. Someone looked into that and proved that he wasn't the son. So there is no illegitimate son. Like they did a probably an ancestry research. So that's something that somebody can confirm. Julia, you just get right on that. Um, something about they they researched his uh, offspring or something and, and went back and said, no, not not related, not related. I don't know how how it became a, a theory that he had an illegitimate son. I don't know where that came from. Um, he gets you. Which one is you? One of the donations was you. Thank you. Oh, God. Oh, you haven't dropped the second yet. Okay. Second set. Okay. Jack the Ripper. The English royal family. They wanted to murder a woman. Who, yeah, I mean, that is that is the um, that is the theory in that film. Uh, let me actually. I think my computer's working overdrive, so let me remove some of these things and close some of these things so it can calm down. Um, that That is a good point, Lori. This is why I have an issue with the uncle, too. He did not stand to gain anything. He was the first wife's brother, so if the entire family would have been killed, the next in line would be the stepmom's family, would it not? I think so. Um unless there was a will putting the uncle in line, I don't see how it would end up in his hands. I guess the theory was something about business. business. He had a business with Andrew Borden and things weren't going well. But I did read his testimony or part of his testimony and he had a note discussing um, some some prospect. And actually, it sounds like they they regularly uh, communicated bo both directions, not just about like the business they shared, but like Andrew Borden would be like, what's your thought on this property? And Uncle John would be like, oh, yeah, I think that's a good investment or something like that. So it doesn't seem like there really was this this like bad blood there between them in a business sense. You know, maybe his business was failing, but maybe that had nothing to do with it. I also think it's interesting that he kept in touch. Like they still were in communication. They still had a relationship. Um, he had a relationship with Emma. He didn't really have a relationship with Lizzie. So if he's still having a relationship with his brother-in-law up until the time of his death, that doesn't really indicate there was some sort of bad blood there. Like, because why would you stay friends? It it really does sound like they they were friendly and they were even like associates and they were even they even still considered each other family, and they even like you know relied on each other for good advice and business and stuff. That that's what it comes off as. But again, I got to look into this mysterious alibi because he also allegedly acted kind of weird when he showed up. As you do. Everyone went out to the pear tree and picked up pears off the ground and ate the pears, even though there's a basket of them in the dining room. I mean, I love fresh fruit too, but it's a weird choice. On a, well, Then again, somebody did suggest that, well, he showed up and he saw that the place was crawling with police and stuff and realized he wasn't going to get lunch. <laughs> Which is true. He was invited back for dinner, supper, whatever. They, they changed the names. Um, so there is kind of that. I mean, that that actually gives him a really good reason, though, to be returning around noon. 
which he was. And, um, you know, may, maybe he's a little confused on, on, or they're a little confused, every, you know, on, did he pick up the pears and stop and talk to an officer? Because the, the one officer who says they saw him first say, say I, I, I didn't see him eating a pear. Who knows? Maybe he went back outside to get a pair because the house was crawling with the police officers and he was like, shit, I'm definitely not getting lunch now. Weird reaction, but people do weird things in shock. You got to admit that. But it is it is bizarre. It is bizarre. The, the, the three people that were in that house, you know, hey, maybe it was all three of them. Maybe it was all three of them. I just don't see a reason why the uncle would have been involved. I don't see what he would have had to gain. I really don't. And he, like, he was visiting family that was checked out. Oh, we have, okay, we have more. So thank you. Thank you to Lori B, Judith N, Lynn M. Is it Lynn or Linne? Looks like Linne. King. <laughs> Gave him morphine and Alka Seltzer. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, Wonderland. Patricia P, Marie W, Teresa W. I do think some of these are repeats, but it, I can't get it together, you guys. If they tell me my naked body is reused contents, I have action. <laughs> so would I, Lady Gray. <laughs> no, they'll just ban me for nudity or whatever. Uh I love that I'm putting the thank yous in between these comments. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Melissa G, Ashley B, Tannis P. Uh, it's so sp suspect, Suzanne's like, all of them did it. I know. Maybe we should just go with all of them. It was a conspiracy. Mm, I know, Lexa. There's so many reaction things. And the only thing that everyone can guess is that's what they're getting me on is the reaction video. And I don't understand. I don't. I have no copyright. None of it. Naomi W, Teresa W, Jennifer G. Thank you. Secret McSquirrel is a super mod because she mods for all the other law tubes. Does Secret Squirrel want a mod? I welcome more mods. I'm probably going to need one for a late night. Dun, dun, dun. Nadine S. Oh, no, we jumped. No. Oh no. Where did it go? Where'd it go? There we go. Uh Nadine S. Tamara. Oh yeah, at tutor your own child, I think. <laughs> they're putting their they're putting their business names in now. <laughs> I don't care. How fast can you turn a dress into a bunch of rags? Good question, Chubby. Pretty quick, if you just want to snurk. But remember, she didn't have to do it all because really the police did such a shitty job when they arrived at first. I mean, sure, she didn't know that was going to happen. But at the same time, if you've never committed a crime, do you even really know what you need to do to cover it up? Maybe she just got lucky with shitty police. Good question. Uh, did they say anything in the movie about her menstruation? No. Neither movie has has gone there. No, they don't mention the pails. They don't mention the bloody rags. And honestly, I think that's one of the most fascinating elements. So I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me. You're telling me that the police were searching the cellar and they were like, what's this, this large pail of water with bloody rags? We have two bodies upstairs and a lot of blood. This is interesting. And they inquired. And the doctor told them, don't you mind that, okay? 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 Just don't you mind that. And they were like, okay, doc. Fuck. Again, shoddy police work. It gets a mention by a detective which is one of those things I'll pull. Um, Secret Squirrel is a boss. <laughs> Secret McSquirrel, you have a fan club. 
You have a fan club. <laughs> uh oh. Watch out. Them them <laughs> them family secrets will creep out. <laughs> Hashtag justice for death. <laughs> Y'all are terrible. <laughs> oh, you're catching the replay. Good for you, Julia. Where did that? I read it earlier. It was a somebody who wrote a book in the 60s. Claims they got an exclusive from the librarian who talked to this this friend. So it's also on. Well, I had I pulled up the screenshot and I read it, but um, I guess I could tweet it. I was gonna say it's it's. I think it's in the forum of that LizzieAndrewBorden.com. I think it's in the forum. I just googled it, found it. Arr. Thank you, Suzanne. Couldn't Lizzie have gone to Ireland after the trial to silence the Latin last witness, though? Tell everyone you go somewhere else, but actually go to Ireland, murder Maggie, and I don't know, continue on to London. I mean, again, maybe, maybe Maggie didn't know that much. So maybe she wasn't that much of a threat. Or she was totally okay with it. That's another theory that maybe the maid wasn't so thrilled with her employment and therefore she just didn't care. <laughs> it's certainly been known to happen. Yes, Jana. Um, the maid claims that she went upstairs to lie down after she let Mr. Borden in and she was lying in bed, but she doesn't think that she fell asleep. And then she heard the clock chime 11, the like, bank clock or something, the big town clock that goes ding, ding, ding. And then she says she heard Lizzie call, call for her and she came down. It's honestly a little suspect too. They're both of their alibis are fucking bullshit. Like you're just walking around a house with dead bodies and you don't know it. Just go take a nap. Okay. Ooh. That's always seemed weird to me, Jay. Why would the lady of the house tell the maid to take it easy? Just seemed weird. Yeah. Yeah. Go have a lie down, maid. It's fine. But if, if it's true that Lizzie was always kind to Bridget, then again, that might be why she was more inclined to help her out. But I'm still struggling with this. She didn't even call her by her name. Instead, she called her Maggie, which was the, the, the name of the first maid. And this woman was only there for two years. Um, so these, these were two grown women that refused to call her by her name. So I don't know. Unless you just didn't care back then. <laughs> Statuesque miss. Construction combo. Const yeah. Let me try a sip of water and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try that again. <laughs> Constructed combos and all, perhaps combos with one person that were different from one with another, changing things on purpose, depending. Yeah, I just think, again, it's one of those things when you actually read their testimony, sometimes it gives you more questions. It's, it's, we've experienced this when you read it or watch it yourself. It's very different from hearing a like summation or specifically the movies versions, um, which are all over the place, but yeah. The, uh, chubby, the father took a nap according to whose testimony? Well, uh, basically the way the body's found <laughs> Everything about it says he was laying down and taking a nap. He was asleep when he got hit. Because um, there's like no reaction, no defense wounds, nothing. In fact, I think they claim he didn't even open his eyes. And they determined that because of the way that I, I don't, I don't want to know. Um, he does look like his body slumps. 
And that would make sense because if you're hitting repeatedly, um, that's going to kind of, you know, make the body shift a little, especially if you're hitting really hard. But yeah, they determined he was, he was asleep because he looks like he was asleep. There's no reason to think he woke up, which again goes back to whoever did it, knew he was in there, knew he was asleep, knew, to, knew they could creep in because the door was allegedly closed. The doors were kept closed. You would. You, there's only two people in that house who even knew he was in that room. That makes them prime suspects. Because the alternative is that some random, or even if you want to go with his Uncle John, kills the stepmom, hides somewhere in the house, waits for the dad to come home, waits for him to lie down, has to know what room he's in. And that's hard to do. There aren't many hallways. There aren't a lot of places to hide. Uh, whoever killed him knew he was in that room and was asleep. And that leaves two people. And technically only one, because Bridget didn't see him go lie down. Only Lizzie is the one who says, oh yeah, I knew he was taking a nap or something. How do you sneak up on somebody if you don't even know where they are? Like, was this prowler just creeping through the house while the maid is upstairs and Lizzie's in the barn? <laughs> and he doesn't hear it. He doesn't wake up. And neither does the maid. And then there's the discrepancy between when she went upstairs. Because now the, the, the last version I read was at 10.58. So her window is like 12 minutes, 12 minutes. The maid's like, uh, I went up, I, I saw them. I went upstairs. She saw Lizzie. She went upstairs, lied down 12 minutes later. She's calling to me and he's dead. Holy moly. That window just keeps getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of like multiple folks saying a man wound up his hand and threw a phone like a baseball. Yeah. Especially people who weren't in the room. <laughs> How did you know that? You, you weren't in the room. I do too. Secret. I do too. Do, do you want to be a mod? <laughs> Everybody wants you to be a mod. Apparently that's what you do. And you do it well. Um, Especially if you pop in late at night, you might get you might get an assignment. Papa Borden's body does look like he was in the process of sitting up, though. Maybe she tried to sneak past. He woke up and panicked and chop chop. Maybe. Maybe. I, I get what you mean. You're talking about how his legs are hanging over the edge. Because that is a weird position. instead of the legs all the way up on the sofa. But he, cause he's also an old man. So maybe he didn't intend to fall asleep. <laughs> maybe he was sitting there and, uh, you know. Um, again, that would imply he knew his attacker. I mean, everything about it implies that they knew who, who killed them. Otherwise, you would have heard the screaming, the screaming when, you know, you see a stranger. I mean, I guess you could be so shocked and then, ah, but super fast. Oh, you're watching Candy already? Oh, girl, wait for it. I think it's only like five parts. By the time you get to the end, you're going to be like, what? What? Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> the Anna Delay case. Is this the fake heiress? I think I know that one. Does anyone know, Jay, does anyone know if Andrew and or Abby's body was tested for poison? Yes. Um, the coroner, they took out their stomachs, which is gross. <laughs> I'm okay with the bloodied skulls, but I'm like, ew, stomach. Ugh. 
They said there was no sign of poison. No sign of poison. So I think it was just like bad food poisoning. Which I, you know, I don't know if they would have been able to determine that per se. They were definitely looking for like toxins, to toxins. So like the poisons of the day, like the cyanide and things like that. I don't know if they would have been able to determine they had like salmonella poisoning. Um, but they could have just had like a light case, you know, of bad food poisoning. Because even if it's just going bad, it's kind of like, it, it makes me think of, <laughs> it makes me think of when you have too much to drink, you know, and um, you're not really like poisoned, technically speaking, because you haven't had that much. You just know that if you vomit, you're going to feel better. That kind of situation. <laughs> She's telling on herself. I've only done that a few times. Ooh, lady, if, if mommy was a bit of a party girl, he could have thought Borden was his father. Oh, 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 the mysterious illegitimate son. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it was just a rumor. You know, people were looking for suspects. And so they, they uh, we, as we have, everybody comes up with a myth and a theory. I mean, you guys have put together literally every possible affair scenario that exists. Even, even down to Lizzie was having an affair with her own father and killed her stepmom. We've got them all. We've got them all. So you kind of run out of theories after a while. So it's like, okay, maybe it was an illegitimate son. But the problem with the illegitimate son theory is, again, what would they have to gain? You're, you're not even going to get the money. You're not going to get anything. It's just possible prison time. I mean, it's true that there doesn't necessarily have to be a motive other than angry. Uh-oh. If you want wild lady killers, watch Uncivil Law Civil Laws thing on Shkabiznes. Uh-oh. I don't know what that is, but it sounds crazy. <laughs> I'm not reading that one because... <laughs> You, you know that's going to attract the bots if I say those words, even though I have it to subscribers. But you know what? You ain't wrong, Jay. A certain television show comes to my mind where we had two cases of incest and everybody was like, ew, for the one. And then for the other, they're like, yay. The hell? Um... Game of Thrones. It's really just a story about incest. <laughs> oh, here goes another. Here goes. I literally just said it. Here goes another affair. Lady Grace. Uncle Theory. Stepmom and Borden had an affair. Killed bio mom together. And the uncle did it as revenge for the sister. Okay. I don't think he would have taken that long. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long wait for revenge. Oh, look at you already finding something. Gray Hat Jen says, Andrew didn't have a will according to one of the papers I have open here. Yeah, no, he didn't. Um, so everything went to the daughters automatically. That's what the 1975 movie works with. They, they allegedly hear a conversation where the stepmom is trying to say, oh, those girls, they're going to leave me high and dry. And Lizzie is like, oh, she, you know, she could live off her fat or something. And then she's like, I'll see her dead before she gets my money or something like that. And then he says, OK, I'll do it. I'll make a will. And she's like, I can he can never make a will. Ah! <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, Jay thinks the uncle was going to get paid off. Maybe. Wait, what? Shanna, I haven't heard this. Rob and... 
crew, do you mean, did mention that Lizzie did give birth to a son and the son's father was Lizzie's father? Ooh, shut up. I mean, if that actually happened, that, well, then I guess we know. Um, ooh. Then I guess the theory that the stepmom might have found out. <laughs> He could he could have called it off. Hmm. I'm gonna need confirmation on that one. That's a crazy theory. Cause that would be. Oh oh, you mean old newspapers? Or no, is it an online thing like an online archive of old newspapers? Is that what we're talking about? What if the pears were as laced with drugs, you guys? <laughs> Well, they'd have to be injecting it as they're on the tree because everybody's out there just pulling it off the ground. Are you talking about like some hallucinogenic good time drugs? Ooh, maybe the pears were actually, um, they were actually turning to wine and everybody was just getting drunk off of pear wine. Is that what we're going with? It made them, it made them kill, it made them kill. That would be hilarious. Ooh. So you're going with, they, they each had a reason to want the other dead. Anything is possible. Ooh. Uncle probably made nice with family to conceal. He put Lizzie up to it. Oh, I don't, I don't know that anybody put her up to it. Maybe she's innocent. But who did it then? Who did it? That's that's where we're going to go next. I don't think it was her middle name or anything. She's just, just they, they, The previous maid was called Maggie. That's the... Hmm... Now I have to look at this photo closer because, you know, I know what you're saying. I agree. All the hits is crazy rage. That's why they say it was personal. It was it was more vengeance than any other motive. Because that is a lot of rage. That's a lot. Like they're dead within three blows. You're done. You're done. You can stop now. But they don't. Whoever did it is like, nah, let me make sure they're really good and dead. Nah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of blows. You need to, <laughs> I'm working. I'm, I might end up with one. I, I'm doing all this research. I could probably write a script on this one. Do, 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 do. Ooh. The sisters conspiring. Now that is a thing. I don't know though. The way Emma and Lizzie eventually like cut ties over some stupid like partying apparently. That's that's definitely not blood is thicker than water. Unless of course it wasn't the that wasn't the reason. And sure would be a thing to do to uh to plant that story if you didn't ever want anybody knowing the real reason. Just start some gossip yourself. Oh, it was because she didn't like the parties I was throwing. Dun, dun, dun. Whoop, whoop. Oh, that's the theory they were going with, that they were being poisoned. But again, they, the, the medical examiner said, nah, no poison, no poison. I think, I think they just were eating bad food, rancid food, which is technically a kind of poison, but apparently they were throwing up the day before. <clears throat> so maybe, maybe this day they actually weren't sick as much as they were just exhausted. 
<coughs> know what I mean? Like the day after you've been ill and you're just like drained and it was hot and icky. That could, that could be the reason. Doo -doo -doo. Oh no, Alicia. It's all right. There's always the replay girl. The fake heiress. Yeah. Netflix did a show on it. I mean, that's certainly, certainly crazy. I, I saw her interview where she was like, I just don't think I did anything wrong. Okay. <laughs> he was nodding off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he fell asleep with his legs over in that position. Because the other alternative is that he literally slung his legs over, but he didn't get his hands up. I don't know. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. Grahat Jen is our expert. And she's like, um, putting feet on the furniture in 1892, walking around with no shoes on. No, 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 no. I know weird things. <laughs> but he was that very per period's version of a ludit. ludit, ludit? Actually, the, yeah, you're accurate. That's pretty accurate. Also, um, I caught this one recently, did not know. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I missed, I missed this altogether. But Lizzie initially said she helped take his boots off. His boots are on in the freaking photographs. So that didn't happen. And also, I seem to recall somebody else like doing that. Let me, let me help you take your boots off. So that's another thing that she either misremembers or lied about because his boots are on and you didn't, you didn't come in and go, Oh no, Papa's boots are off. Let me put them on while he's a dead body. Nope. Things that didn't happen. Oh my gosh. No one has yet to say the father had an affair with his brother. <laughs> Master. <laughs> All right, there we go. You, you win, you win. You came up with a new one. Woo. Well done. Well done. Oh, thank you, Mary. Another week to try. I don't know. Yeah, it is true. It is true, Tim. The Lizzie Borden case is just as much a mystery as Jack the Ripper and that there are so many theories that finding any real truth is a wash. True, but we do have a lot more documents and information um, thanks to the trial. You know, so you can actually read people's testimonies and look at what the police looked at. With the Ripper, you've only got what the police offered. And they, I think they, I would actually assume that they kept a lot of things private unless it has since been opened, you know, to the public documents and things, because at the time you certainly wouldn't want to release information that could allow somebody to claim something, you know, that you don't, oh, we don't want them to know that yet. So that could be, a, that could be part of the reason, but have they ever opened up the files? That would be interesting. I've never actually looked. <laughs> Wonderland, Game of Thrones. Ew. <laughs> all monarchy is incest oh gosh we've started something now I'm going to attract a whole different audience this is oh wow a crazy case okay so we've got another modern one Erp. you're in yet it's okay. It's okay. You can be lost. I allow lostness. Hi, Libby. And wasn't it in the same medical people who said menstrual blood for sure somehow? Yep. Well, no, no, no. Wait. Nope. Dr. Bowen was the one who said, oh, yes, Lizzie, explain that to me. Don't you worry your pretty little heads with it to the detectives. And they were like, okay. The medical examiner, the coroner, is the one who said that check the bodies for like poison and all that jazz and determine time of death and all of that. So there, there is no confirmation about the menstrual thing. 
And one thing I read said that they wouldn't, they wouldn't dare, especially for a high born lady. No, 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 no. So there is something to this bloody bucket. <laughs> I'm just going to unraveling dresses, bloody buckets and other things. <laughs> I'm going to have all the worst things. <laughs> Uh, Christina Ricci was barefoot in that scene where you pointed out the rapper Jess. That's true. Um, but again, you know, do we take, do we take Lizzie's word for it that she was wearing stockings and black shoes walking around the house or did she take them off? By then she might've had to take them off because she'd already committed one murder. Dun, dun, dun. Maybe he wouldn't notice if her dress is long enough that she was walking around without shoes on. Oh, gosh. Now we're shipping the father and the uncle. <laughs> oh, no. Y'all are terrible. Oh, good. Yeah, go write a write a fanfic. There you go. If, if it's good enough, I'll turn it into a movie. Because, you know, that's a, that's a, that checks all the boxes today. All the boxes. But we might also have to have a lesbian relationship. So we'll just make it extra gay, like double layers of gay just, and murder. We win. We win. We could get an Oscar with this one. <laughs> it fits all the qualifiers. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, you guys are terrible. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Thank you, Drunk Mom Gaming. <laughs> I love everything about that. She's she's a drunk mom gaming. Nope, they didn't even check the blood. Didn't check the blood. I don't think they would even have any way to know, but apparently they just took the doctor's word for it that that's what it was. Yep. Justice for death. <laughs> We're just going to confuse everyone. Oh, Chronicling America, everybody. It's from the Library of Congress. Thanks, Kate. You may find more new more old newspaper articles for free. Is that a random plug? I don't know, but I like information like that. Really simple next year. That's a little too quick. I don't know if we can get a whole script and shoot it and get it out in a year, but we could try. Oh. It has every messy detail for a hit movie. It does. That's why they keep doing it. They keep doing it. I finally caught up on the comments. Woo! Yeah. Oh, there's a four-page scene that's about Nance O'Neill and some reporter later lady. It's actually really interesting. I'm I'm assuming you you found a newspaper. Oh. I'm discovering this, Kate, that uh, old newspapers have the most random gossip. <laughs> I mean, what? Uh, I guess it's always been a moneymaker, huh? All right, you guys, I probably better wrap this up because I'm also being told that my live streams being so long might be a problem for YouTube because, you know, they just can't. They just can't take in this much content and decide that I'm a real human being doing my own thing or something. I don't know. But it'd be a short script. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, he really wasn't visiting enough to have to for it to be an affair. Old newspapers were Facebook. Oh my. Oh my. So are, is there a is there a column where somebody just accuses their uncle of being racist? <laughs> Low key. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Oh, it's time for Emily DeBaker. Oh, good. So I these are things I need to know. Maybe this is why my viewers drop off at about this time. I, I know, I know, I know Libley, but I'm not monetized yet. So what's the deal? 
Ah. Thank you. Loving the content. It's not a mystery, but what about looking into the Parker, Parker home murder case? The Heavenly Creatures movie and Ann Perry. Ooh. I'll write that down. I mean, if it's just crazy, it's crazy. And hold on, I gotta find, I gotta find where I'm keeping these. Um, as long as there's like a like a like a take on it, you know. Okay, Parker. Oh, it doesn't it doesn't like that name. I think I know the heavenly creatures. I'm not sure. I think I know what you're talking about. I think I heard about this. It's the author who like writes about the murder that she commits. Oh, everybody likes it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the YouTube, so again, next, the 15th, I get to reapply. I don't think it, I don't think it's going to help until I can at least hit that button. If they deny me again, my, my next option is to literally just blast them because, oh, Kate's, Kate Winslet. Oh, I love Kate Winslet. Um, I basically even already have the appeal video ready if they tell me it's reused content. So. deny me again and if they deny my appeal video or if, if they like don't like my appeal video like they didn't like it last time i will i will put it live so everybody can see that i did exactly what they asked for in the video i'll be like there's no way a real human being is looking at this like there's no way um <laughs> so Maybe next Tuesday. I haven't decided yet. I might I might see if like Rob wants to pop by and give us his speculation because he was very careful to avoid saying whether he thinks that she did it or not. But um, you know, I've I've read so much about this already, and there's just not like there's so much more, but it's more of the speculation. So I feel like at least one more episode where we go down the rabbit hole of what what is with the dress? What is with the bloody pail? What is with John Uncle John and his alibi? And who was having an affair with who? Because obviously we need to decide. <laughs> I don't think anybody was having an affair, but you never know. Maybe, maybe I'll stumble on another motive. Maybe. You never know. I'll see if I can verify any of this like thievery too, because every movie has had that. Everything has had that, her stealing things. And that would certainly be an issue. That would certainly be an issue. And this one, the Ricci one, actually has the father saying, and I've paid your fines. Now, I don't know if she was ever charged with something like hit with a fine. Cause you would think that would, that would be information readily available. Um, if I have a guest on it, might help. I don't know. Um, possibly. Those are, um, those are like some of my most popular streams. They have most, the, the most views when I have somebody else on, but um, I'm not going to torture somebody with this. Like, <laughs> um, like Andrea is one of my biggest ones. And I could have her back. I don't know if she looked into the Lizzie Borden case. You should be like, would you defend her? She'd be like, yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> what I think I will avoid doing until I can get past this hump, hopefully. I don't know. Because next week I was going to give you guys... I was going to give you a rant. I was going to give you a, a, a one of these. I was going to upload some new videos that are in the editing bay. 
And I was going to introduce you to a whole new character and thing. Now I'm not sure. Because I don't want to go through all that effort only for YouTube to tell me I have to delete it. So, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I don't see how a video of me purely speculating about uh, this case is going to be reused content. I can't possibly fall into that category. Ah. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Wait, wait. Specifically, if you're going to watch my videos. Um, okay, these are good. These should be safe. Anything that's my original, just like completely original. Because I'm, I'm removing some of them. The questionable ones. I guess I could just go ahead and do it. Um, because they said that they will probably look at your most popular ones. Don't watch the actor react ones. Don't watch those because those are the ones that everybody th thinks are sus the possible s issue. Uh, I don't know. I know people over at Twitch that it took them just as much to get partner. And also I just, I don't feel like Twitch is the right platform for what I do. I don't know. I've been told I could just go sit there with my boobs out and, you know, make money, but we'll see. We'll see. I'd give them one more week and then get angry. I just, <laughs> uh, that's true. I could do that. I could also just put the rants on Twitter. Apparently. I don't know. Sussy. Yeah. Feet is enough for Twitch. Oh my gosh. Y'all stop. I can't. Mm, tug doesn't help me. Um, no one has replied, but uh, Alita to any of my inquiries. Well, Rob has tried to help, but he's like new here. So he's like, I don't know, maybe this. Um, oh, you found one, Lori? There is only one reference article I can find where it is mentioned about her shoplifting and it was after the murders. Yeah. I feel like it's definitely maybe a myth thing, but maybe not. But I also thought, like, her dad being so, like, uptight about money, it's possible that she just would go into stores and just would be like, well, I want this. And I know if I just take it and say, put it on my tab or whatever, that dad's going to pay for it rather than, you know, make it make a scene and look bad because he, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it could have been something like that, that then people then took out of context and said, oh, she was stealing. When in that time, families like that would have had credit. So, you know, you could take something and they put it on your tab and then, oh, okay, well, you know, he'll pay the bill next week or next month or whatever. So could have been that, could have been that, or it could just be made up. Who knows? They, she, she did seem to imply there was a lot of gossip that wasn't true. Rob is the new kid who's trying to help everybody. Rob is great. The shoplifting will be rough. The courthouse might have it. Maybe. Rob and Runkle. I think they do that when they do um, get together. You're not a bot. You're definitely not a bot. I'm not a bot. None of us are bots. I'm tired of being called unoriginal. God darn it. Look, I didn't even curse that time. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we're going to wrap it up. And uh, I didn't do anything that should have violated any of the rules, YouTube. I did not play a clip. 
Sure, I read some articles from 1800s. But I gave commentary. So there. Um, she's not a bot. She's an animatronic. <laughs> yes, I'm actually the latest technology from Disney. Aren't I awesome? Don't I look so real? They put us up and they put us up in a small apartment in Hollywood just so that we 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 look like real humans, and we go we go around and we do real human things. And um, it's all, this is all just to get you used to it and to think that I'm a real human and um, my franchise will be out next year. <laughs> That's how it works. They're now just breeding um, animatronic superheroes. It's all, it's all, this is all an illusion. <laughs> Quality content. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is where we get, this is where we get to do. Quality Oh, uh, wait, what? Lori Hall found something. There was a warrant taken out for Lizzie due to a painting that was stolen after the murders, but it was dropped by the store when she said she'd pay for it. <gasps> oh, okay. That, that sounds pretty solid. And that's after the murders? Okay, girl does seem like she just takes what she wants. Sure, yeah, no, I'll pay for it now <laughs> that you caught me. What? Where did you find that, Lori? And y'all are fast. This, see, this is why we have, this, this is why we end up being four hours long because I'll be like, hmm, I wonder about that. And then you guys are like, ooh, receipt. We're literally solving crimes. We're literally solving crimes over here. Maybe we'll unravel this case. That'll be fun. We can all get credit. Um, I'll hire someone to write the book because I don't know if I have that kind of patience, but I will definitely be in the movie. Okay. I could play Lizzie Borden. I could totally play Lizzie Borden. I actually have the right like eye color and I think her hair was maybe a little lighter, but I can work. I can, I can do that. Um, <sighs> Sorry, James, we're not saying she's killed. I've said several times, unless somebody else did it. Are you just an Amber Heard troll? The whole point is we are speculating. And I'm actually reviewing a movie that literally makes her guilty. So it's kind of the point. If you're asking my opinion... I still don't know. I still don't know because there's a lot of things that don't add up. That's the whole point. She is technically innocent. Talked about the trial. Anyway, if you don't like the content, you're welcome to log off. Bye. <laughs> Do you not know what we're doing? I'm literally making a whole episode of speculation and other suspects. It's not me. It's, it's Hollywood that's like, these, these people don't exist. Okay. Anyways, why do I always get some somebody like that? Wait, are you also related to Lizzie Borden? Because Rob got one of those and it was hysterical. <laughs> she was mad she was really mad but she also basically said she did it <laughs> she just said she had her reasons the heck okay that seems intense also if you know something you should definitely tell the authorities <laughs> oh god I don't know everyone thinks I'm a bot Exactly. That's what we're doing. We're debating. It is an unsolved case. That's the whole point. That doesn't necessarily mean that she didn't do it. 
It just means nobody knows yet. I have no, I don't remember who, she, I don't remember what she claimed, but it was hysterical. It was like, I'm a descendant of something. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm going, yes, I am trying to kill you with laughter. <laughs> that is my goal in life. Um, those reasons are, we, we don't know, Wonder, we don't know, Wonderland, we don't. Because she didn't, she didn't elaborate. She just attacked Rob, even though Rob did not say, again, he didn't say, he didn't say whether he thought she was guilty or not. He was like, but she was literally attacking him. Like he said, she was like, he was con condemning her and convicting her. And she was like, do your research. She had her reasons. Do you want to share that with the rest of us? Because you make it sound like it's well known <laughs> when all I have found is myth upon myth upon myth, you know, the whole lesbian thing, the whole incest thing, the everything. It's all just gossip. There's not a lot of anything to back all that up, which is why, yeah, she, she might be the innocent party, but that still leaves the question of then who could have done it? Who could have done it? There's people like that in every Lizzie Borden. Oh, they just pop in to be like, because they're the, the, the innocent crowd. I mean, if you think she's innocent, come on, give me, give me. Let's go, let's go. Give me some reasons, James. You just come in and you make a shit comment and then you leave like, why don't you tell us why? If, if, if you're convinced, why? And who, is, who do you think did it? Who do you think did it? Or are you literally like not even going to question it until somebody is convicted in a court of law? Because I have bad news for you. <laughs> this case is never going to court. <laughs> then literally the state felt it wasn't worth it. They abandoned it completely. They released the evidence to none other than the prime suspect, Lizzie Borden. She has the evidence. She gave it to her lawyer. Well, her lawyer kept some of it. Not all of it. That's suspicious. Just some of it. So what happened to the rest? Was it destroyed? Where's the dress? Where's the dress? <laughs> Thank you, Lexi. I tried. I actually tried to turn them this way, which, which would have had them coming towards my head, <laughs> which I knew. I was like, this is, this could be a bad idea, but they're low enough. I was like, they're not going to like come down and hit me in the head. But um, they're, they're actually angled just a little bit, they curve just a little bit. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't sit on the wall the other direction. So maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that was a sign. <laughs> Let's not put them pointing towards your head just in case. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. Yeah, that's probably true about the lesbian thing. I also think that it just comes from her and the maid being the two in the house, maybe. I don't know. Here you go. Here's all your evidence for your murder scrapbook. Yeah, really. That's basically, I mean, but the fact that she said she didn't care allegedly she didn't care what he did with it i'm like ooh you don't want to know who did it i mean if it was you if it was you and you'd been accused of those murders and it was your father your own father that would have been my entire life's goal i'd have spent every last dime i'd have spent every last waking minute I'd have solved that goddamn case myself. She says she don't care. And she just went on with her life. She moved into a new house. She went out and make these new friends, went and traveled, partied, all that jazz. I don't know. I don't know. That seems to me like somebody who knew who did it, whether it was her or somebody else. I feel like she knew who did it. 
but never pointed a finger at anybody else ever. So unless you want to go with the crazy, like some random crazy person broke in and did it. And then, and if it was that person who committed that other crime, like I said, they, they were eventually imprisoned for the one they allegedly did commit. So they were found guilty for that. So they were punished. But I would think after a certain point, they would have just confessed. They, oh yeah, I killed the Bordens too. That was me. Especially back in those days. People would people would do that all the time. They'd get, a, they'd get caught and then they'd be like, well, let me tell you about all the other crimes I committed. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. It'll be in the newspaper, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it'll be in the newspaper. <laughs> You're also never leaving here. And, and I'm not even sure if that... Um, he might have been executed. The blurb I read said he was charged. I don't know if he was executed. Um, Cause if he was, if he was literally executed for it, then that's usually when they're like, okay, well, you know, since you're going to kill me, let me just tell you, I also killed those two people over there. <laughs> it was me. You know what he could have done? He could have turned himself in for the $5,000 reward. <laughs> one way of doing it. I'll tell you who did it. Give me the $5,000. You'll get your conviction because I'll confess. That would be an interesting play. Maybe she was going to pay someone to find the real killer like OJ. <laughs> she sure didn't though. There's a horrible old country music song called Where's the Dress? And I now have it playing through your mind, right? But was she ever violent again? I mean, no. Not that we know of. I mean, the Lizzie Borden Chronicles sure, sure go there. That's the series with Christina Ricci that follows the aftermath of the movie. And uh, yeah, they, they go way, way off. It's, it's, it, it says fictionalized in the, uh, in the description. It's not bad. It's just weird. Like they have, I think they might have her killing the so-called illegitimate brother or something that shows up. <laughs> they have her murdering someone else. Um, and they have some detective who's like on her case. He's absolutely convinced that she did it. And, you know, she she's killed all these people and she's getting away with it. Um, she might sleep with him. I'm not sure. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely sex. I mean, we had hot detective and random hot strangers. So, you know, they, they just really wanted to get there. Ooh, maybe. I really feel like the only other option, though, would be the maid. And if Lizzie covered that up, that would certainly imply they were very close. Yeah. That is the part I like with the Ricci one, but then after it veers off, yeah, it goes. <gasps> it's a, it, it, I think it's on Amazon, if you're curious. If you're, like, bored and you're like, eh, let me stream this. It gets pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> like real quick it gets real wild all right guys well i'll keep i'll keep going down the rabbit hole and next week maybe i could i could just turn this into a whole thing there's an entire podcast dedicated to nothing but lizzie borden <laughs> i found it the other day i was like okay wow um this case definitely continues to fascinate people left and right like and I can see why. I can see why. Because no matter what you think, whether she's innocent or guilty, you've got you you've got a lot of case to make there. And it's easy to point to other suspects. It's just hard to prove, which is why she was acquitted. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if Emma you know, that's the thing. Like obviously they were reporting on Lizzie and and 
gossiping about Lizzie all the time, but Emma kind of just got out of Dodge and lived a quiet life. And I don't know. That's one of the things that I have issue with. If you've ever known somebody who's capable of such things, let's just say, they don't keep people around them. You know, they, the, those, the people eventually like run, they run for the hills and, you know, you've got the maid getting out of Dodge. You've got Emma eventually cutting ties. The uncle never had ties with Lizzie. Like she did kind of end up kind of alone. Um, almost like people found out, you know, or started to suspect, or she was just a difficult person. Who saw the maid that day, Lady Grey? Um, the neighbor's maid, apparently. I'm assuming you mean during the time of the murders? She talked to the neighbor's maid at one point while washing the windows. But I mean, people saw her washing the windows too, apparently. That was pretty fairly backed up. So there would have been, again, she would have had to go in the house, kill the stepmom, come out, wash more windows, <laughs> go back in the house, wash the inside windows, um, let Bort, Mr. Borden in, murder him, go upstairs for a nap and clean herself up and then come down, I guess. I... Lizzie has a lot more free time. Yeah, they can't keep people around them. Oh. That doesn't mean there's not a po another possibility. Maybe I'll like maybe I'll like Uncle John the more I read about his so-called alibi. But the thing I read from the police said it totally checked out. That he was he went to visit the family and his other family in the morning. That um like three of them are like yeah he was here. And he was here until about 11-ish or something. And then he left. And then he says he gets on the streetcar and there's seven priests or something. <laughs> and then there is a little discrepancy on the time that he arrives at the house. But that, you know, it's, it's either between like 11, 20 or 12, something in there. And I think that could just be because, you know, when he arrived, he said there wasn't that much fanfare yet. But he went around back to the side door and um, allegedly got some pears and then allegedly talked to one of the officers standing there or something. So maybe he was like, let me find out what's going on before I go inside. But that's kind of weird. Um, That could be. She, she could have been. It does sound like she was a very stoic person. And sometimes, which is weird. That kind of goes opposite of being somebody who's like out of control if you're very stoic, but then not, not all the time. Maybe she had bipolar disorder <gasps> Ooh. or the other one, borderline personality disorder before it was known. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, this is the first season. It's going to be all Lizzie Borden all the way until we solve the crime. Yes, pairs of the muffins in this case. That's hilarious. Let's speculate about Bohemian Grove. I don't know that one. Okay, you know what, Chubby? We might have to keep that in for the, the speculation episode because, yes, allegedly, their dresses sound very similar. Very similar. It is not as depicted in the movies where she's wearing a maid uniform. Nope. Uh-uh. No. When I read her testimony about what she was wearing that day, I went, whoa. Wait, what? So, yeah. Maybe you're on to something. Maybe the two witnesses that thought they saw Lizzie leaving the barn at 1103 saw the maid. Because she said she was going to the barn to get water. Interesting. Or you're saying, could the could 
Lizzie had been the one outside. Well, but then the neighbor maid would know if she was talking to the maid or <laughs> Lizzie Borden. But if the witnesses actually only saw the maid going to the barn and back into the house, And 1103 could work. She says she came in. She went upstairs. She thought she was only upstairs for a short time. Then 1110, she comes down. Although she says she was in bed when she heard the clock chime 11. So I want to know how they're so sure, sure it was 1103. That's so specific. They had to look at the clock at the exact minute or something. Hmm. Ooh, what if the other maid lied? Could be, could be. All right, you guys are already in the speculation. Uncle John. <laughs> Uncle John dressed as a maid. There we go. No, Uncle John dressed as Lizzie Borden. Bingo, we've done it. We've solved the case. Woo. All right. Okay, write down all your theories. All your theories. You got to get your research in. I'm going to put a poll. I'll figure out how to do a poll because that's going to be fun. Uh, I wonder how long I can leave it up. I haven't looked. And and everybody gets to decide who you think done it. Who you think done it. And next week, we're going to talk about the dress and the bloody bucket. And if I can find any more information about the mysterious hatchet, on the roof. I read the thing about the one that they thought they found in the barn that wasn't a hatchet. But I can bring that in. Because we're missing a murder weapon. We have other suspects. And we have the mystery of the dress. It's also tasty. It's also tasty. Ooh, yeah. You can also totally, I always forget about the comments because I have the chat, <laughs> but you can absolutely comment on the video. Sometimes I remember to go look at them. I swear I do. I do. Uh, I'll do it more. I promise. She says. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll have got off the deep end. <laughs> oh. Everybody's obsessed with the seven priests. Like what? Like, as you should be. Because now we've turned it into a game of Clue. Y'all are hysterical. It is a massive tasty snack. I had no idea. I I remember watching this version of, you know, this movie. Um, probably back when it came out. And I enjoyed it. And I, I thought that was the... I thought that was the myth. I, I mean, I thought that was the case, you know, that she did it naked or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And now the more I learn, the more I'm like, wait, this is insane. What? She had no clue that they took their heads off. She thought that was, yeah. I would, yeah, probably. I would faint too. And I don't, I heard two different versions. Um, one, he pulled, he, he pulled the dress or something too fast and it accidentally revealed them or something. It does sound like the start of a joke. It does sound like, it. I guess, I guess James did not abandon us altogether. <laughs> Is it because I started saying there's other suspects? Did you just join us? The whole point is we were going through the movie versions. And I was pointing out their inaccuracies. That's where we started. But I still want to solve this mystery of this dress. So if you know anything about the missing dress, James. Because um, the dress that Lizzie Borden describes wearing. Does not sound like the dress that she would be wearing. Does not sound like the dress that other people describe her wearing. Then she changes her dress. There's a whole lot of crazy. A whole lot of crazy. Now we've gone into animal cruelty. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you everyone for coming to my crazy stream. And for the tips um, or donations, whatever we're calling them today, I don't, I don't know. Um, I have to remove the links as I go, as you do. <laughs> and uh, everything got messed up. I was going to be doing this yesterday and then I was going to do another just like random live today. That didn't happen, obviously. I think I've heard a rumor that that Brian fella is going to be visiting from uh, wherever Timbuktu he lives in. And so I'm not planning on doing anything this weekend because, or streaming anyway, I'm going to be editing, but I'm not going to stream. I'm not going to say that out loud. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but I might be uploading some little things here and there. And then uh, I'll probably see you next week. I'm going to say Tuesday. I'm going to say Tuesday. But I might ask Rob if he's free to pop by. He doesn't have to stay for the whole time. He could pop by. And he has one of those like real jobs, you know. So if he's like, oh, I can't on Tuesday. But how about Thursday? Maybe we'll do it Thursday. But that just leaves us all more time to dig deeper. Maybe we'll solve this case. Maybe we'll solve this case. If Lizzie Borden didn't do it, who did it? I would be, I would actually be thrilled if I could like clear somebody's name. That'd be cool. Like, ha I proved it was so-and-so by such and such. But I don't know. There's a lot of issues. Testimony, missing dress. Oh, it's a mess. It's a mess. I picked the hardest one. I picked the hardest one. <laughs> we were. Um, we were going to do art one of these days. I would need uh, more canvases. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Gray hat Jen is to the point she thinks she did it. Are you a time traveler? Because that is cool. Also, I have a favor I need to ask. <laughs> I mean, I'm at the point where I'm like, I don't know, maybe everybody did it. Maybe everyone was in on it. Maybe it was the marshal. I don't know. Maybe it was the doctor. Everybody's pointing fingers at the doctor, too. I'm like, there was the whole, he he was rushing away in his carriage. And I'm like, well, he's a doctor. Doesn't he have like emergency calls? I, I mean, I'm so confused. And I'm sure a doctor could find an easier way to kill two people than with a bloody hatchet. I mean, that's, that's just unnecessary. <laughs> he could have done it much easier, much cleaner, and probably much less suspicious. <laughs> Here, have a... Have a little too much of this. Oopsie. <laughs> oh, goodness. Wait, what? Oh, thank you, Mary. You actually downloaded PayPal. Thank you. Extra points for effort. Mary, everybody. Whee! I probably, that's probably why my phone is buzzing. It is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you guys. I will see you next week. Look at that. We almost hit four hours again. I was going to make it two. Y'all are killing me. <laughs> but thank you for listening to my random rambling. And also, we're trying to solve a crime. So, like, that's cool. <laughs> I don't think we're going to. If only we could find the murder weapon. Maybe. Maybe. Have a good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you are in this world. I don't know. Have a good day. How about that one? Just day or night. I got to work on that. I was not planning on doing the Kristen Stewart one. I just, I don't want to watch it again. Once was enough. <laughs> I think it's way more fun to, to dig in and, and speculate. It's way more fun. And it's original. Ooh, 2 a.m. there. You sound like a me. I'm a night owl. All right, guys. Have a great evening. Or, yeah, see, I still can't get it right. 
have a great day. Have a great day. Oh, and hopefully I'll have my microphone and everything back. Bye, everybody. Lizzie Borden took an ax. Maybe not. Lizzie Borden took an ax to be determined. I don't know. She definitely didn't give anybody 40 wax. That's not true. I'll figure out a sign off. I don't know. <sighs> wait, wait, wait. This remains an ongoing investigation. There we go. This is an ongoing investigation. It remains an ongoing investigation. There we go. Bye, everybody. <laughs>